I might as well move okay. down here so that we can share this. Okay. Do you want to scoot over? Yeah, well, it doesn't matter if you scoot over or if I sit over there. Okay, Paul, is that working? <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks to the committee for uh, carving out and sharing some of your time and talents with us this afternoon. Um, thanks for those of you here in the audience that are here to um, watch the proceedings of the committee. And to those of you that are watching on our live stream channel at azdhs.gov. So we've got a full agenda tonight. Um, our plan is to go till 8 o'clock, so we've got a number of presentations that we need to get through. So with that, I'll just go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, I have some news <laughs> really quickly. Um, uh, we have a change in the committee from the previous, um, from the previous three, and Janice Bovee has decided to share talents with us here on the committee um, as uh, the representative for the nurse midwives. Do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Thank you very much. So I'm Janice Bove. Bove. That's all right. A uh, certified nurse midwife. Very happy to be here. Thrilled to be a part of this committee. <clears throat> OK, so with that, we'll, it really sounds, maybe I'm just talking. Yep. Is this on? Okay, that, yeah, that sounds a lot better. Um, all right, so folks on the committee will go ahead and call the meeting to order. We have a full quorum, and I think we have everybody here today. Um, so let's just go ahead and um, uh, take roll. So I'm Will Humble, the chair of the committee. Janice Bovey, nurse midwife. Wendy Kleckner, licensed midwife. Julie Gunnigal, I'm here as a member of the public. Jeff Northup, Chief Medical Officer, uh, Summit Healthcare in Sholo, and also a member of the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors, Arizona Perinatal Regional System. Mary Langlois, Licensed Midwife. Allison Fernstrom, Member of the Public. Maria Mandricus, OBGYN and Chair of Arizona American Congress of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. She's like, no. And on the phone? And she's... Susan Hadley, I'm a family physician down in Tucson. I'm part of the faculty, and I'm on the phone. Okay, thanks you for joining us from Tucson on the phone. Um, let's go ahead and move to our first order of business, which is to look at the minutes uh, of our first couple of meetings. The first was on December 17th, and the second was on January 14th. So hopefully folks here at the committee have had an opportunity to review those minutes. Um, if not, we'll just take a few minutes, uh, not even minutes, just we'll, we'll take a few seconds to sort of review those minutes, and then we'll have a motion um, to approve those minutes. Then we can move on to Allison's presentation about exploring options, which is the next thing on our agenda. So um, take a few minutes to, or a few seconds to take a look at that.
We have December here. Janice, did you want December? I would love to. Oh, here, thank you. Thank you. Of January. Okay, do you, you think we're ready for a motion? Okay, so we'll entertain a motion um, from the committee to approve the minutes from December 17th and January 14th. Motion. Thank you. So, uh, motion, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, anybody opposed? Anybody not voting? Okay, um, thanks everybody and uh, from this point forward, our minutes will be ready uh, right after the meeting. Um, so with the, by the end of the week, we'll have the minutes from this meeting available up on the website. I know the first couple of meetings were uh, a little bit behind in that respect. Uh, so let's press ahead then. Um, Allison, we've got you on the agenda for 15 minutes. Uh, by the way, all the presentations are loaded onto one file. So as we progress through the various presentations uh, this evening, uh, you know, we'll just continue to roll through this the PowerPoint. Um, Tom, are you forwarding the slides or? Yes. Okay, so just sort of nod to Tom as you're ready to uh, oh. move the slide. Okay. okay, all right, take it away. Okay, um, I th the way I decided to do it from a uh, consumer standpoint is just to kind of look at what we've got right now for the draft rules and work from there and see what we find, you know, as a consumer I and what I hear from other consumers find acceptable and, and see if we can provide some other options on things that aren't working. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so um, the last thing that, the, in the last draft, in this pre right draft they just put up a couple of week, uh, days ago, they suggested an advisory committee that will be there for midwives to use and they'll, you know, be able to update their rules and regulations and stuff like that. Um, and I can't, I can't express how much I like this idea. I'm totally in favor of an advisory committee. Um, so go ahead, you can go to the next one. Go ahead. So the midwives, I am 100% sure that they're in favor of an advisory committee as well because it was in their report that they submitted. Um, some things that they had in there, that one of the big things is just that they, they want to make sure that it is majority of licensed midwives. Um, they suggested five midwives and two consumers. Go ahead, Tom. You can go through. I'm going to skip through that just, just so that stuff is on there so people can go back and look at it. But if I talked about it all, it would be way too long. Um, one big thing I think we should focus on is that if we're going to move to NARM as um, it, they're going to be doing all the testing, then we should follow a lot of the recommendations that they're making. So NARM's recommendation is that we have an uh, advisory committee or board or whatever word you want to use um, that's made up of the majority of licensed midwives. And there can be physicians and things like, and, and doctors and family docs and OBs on there, but that it really has to be the majority has to be licensed midwife because they understand their practice more than anybody else can. Um, uh, this, there's just more recommendations of what NARM suggests for what the advisory committee looks at. And it, what you guys already put in the draft is pretty, you know, is acceptable for things that the advisory committee could look at. Uh, another thing I think the department seems to base a lot of their decisions on is what other states are doing. And so if we look at what other states are doing, if you put all those up there, um, we have Washington, New Hampshire, Florida, and, and lots of other states have one too. These are just some of the examples. But if you see that all of them are based off of licensed midwives being the majority. And, and there, there is some medical representation on each of these committees. But just noticing that it, it's the licensed midwives who are the majority. And you know, preferably, I like Texas a lot. <laughs> I think that they're a good model. They have a lot of midwives on there, and they do have an OB and then a family doc or a pediatrician, you know, kind of for the baby, um, and then members of the public. So I think we just, what needs to be made sure that happens, I think, with this advisory committee, which again, I am totally in favor of an advisory committee, um, it's just that there is a knowledge and an understanding of home birth because if we put together this committee that is not conducive and they don't work together, it will be so ineffective and it will not make a home birth more safe. It will not make it, you know, transfers better or anything like that. We have to, there has to be people on this committee who can work together. 
Um, so just some basic recommendations for the committee. Go ahead. Um, just that we make sure that the majority is licensed midwives. And it, it's not that um, the majority is people who believe in midwifery care, but that the majority is truly licensed midwives. Um, and, and again, use Texas as an example. And just that there's an understanding of home birth. Um, and then the last point I wanted to bring up is, so when this committee here was created, it was created for the bill, and um, we discussed who should be on it, and we met with lobbyists to figure out what representation should be had. And this is what we needed to come up in order to move forward and get the rules opened. Um, but I do not think it should be indicative of what what continues on by any means. Because if we look at even in the department, you guys licensed, you know, audiologists and, you know, the people who are under special licensing, if you look at what their committee, their advisory committee is, it's made up of people from their professions and, you know, they have multiple different professions in that same licensing. But it's made up of their professionals and I think we need to make sure that that is 1,000% the way that this runs because having an advisory committee will be awesome and it will do wonderful things for for um, licensed midwives and the consumers, but it's it's got to be run by people who know who know midwifery care better than any of us do. Um, just, oh, that went to the very end. That's my last slide. <laughs> Hmm, okay. It should be going to, I believe, transfer care next. Is it going there? That's bad news. <laughs> okay, that's it. Maybe my last slide just got randomly messed up. Okay. So one thing I wanted to kind of cover is informed consent. And just one thing to to be aware of is that in the midwifery model of care, our, as consumers, we have prenatal visits that last at least, an, usually an hour. Sometimes they're 45 minutes, but typically it's an hour long. So we don't just sit there and shoot the breeze. We're talking about things that are important to our care, just you know, from super basic things to really big decisions. And so it's something that is, you know, we don't need one piece of paper to talk about informed consent. It is constant and ever going, and it's this shared informed decision making process. Um, but I, I want to make sure that, you know, so the department, if, if people didn't get to see it yet, but they recommended or they have a form on there for informed consent. And I personally don't have a big issue with it. It's pretty, it's, it's more basic than I would have suggested but I don't I don't I don't think there's an issue with it at all because I think that midwives could will will and could go much deeper in their own in what they do during their prenatal visits um, but if it's something that need, you know if the department wants to see that if they want that form you know that blanket informed consent I, I don't think that's a big deal but just keeping in mind and I think it's important to keep in mind this whole time is that the point of the bill was to reduce the regulatory burden. So every time we add a new thing that they have to do, it's not actually reducing regulatory burden. Um, but, you know, and, and also a big thing that I think needs to be in there is just that we not only do we, ha do we need to do informed consent, but we, ha we also need to have rightful re rights for refusal as well. <coughs> I just want to cover really basic on smooth transition because it's not my um, it's not my area of expertise. But as I talk to different consumers and midwives who do transfer, um, you know, one thing we can think of is you know I'm just trying to throw out ideas, see what we can come up with. But if if it's an emergency and the first point of contact is an EMT, then you know what is there something going wrong there? You know, is it a level of just maybe the EMTs don't understand even what a licensed midwife is, what their expert expertise is, and it, midwives can provide information to the EMTs to try to make that smoother. I hear that's a concern. I don't know that it's always a concern, and that doesn't always go well, but it's something to consider, and may, maybe, you know, the midwives can provide more education for the EMTs on what they are capable of doing, and it might help out a little bit better. Um, and I know I'm sure there's tons of liability issues with this, but when they're actually transport in the ambulance, and, you know, if, if a midwife could could accompany them, and I'm, sh I'm sure there's many liability issues, but just something to consider if the midwife is there continuing that care, and what that does for the consumer is a level of comfort, and you know, and, and then you have the expertise of a midwife who's there with an EMT who doesn't have as much training in childbirth than a midwife does. Um, and, then, and then for, you know, once we 
reach the hospitals, what can we do there? And I think there's so much more that we can gather from Washington's model, um, and they, they, they have a lot more. And the point, of, you know, the point of entry needs to be at the hospital. So maybe reaching out to some of these major healthcare systems you know, and, and reaching out there. And I know Mercy Gilbert's doing a great job. Of, they're trying really hard to make sure that we have better transitions. And the midwives there are actively reaching out in the hospitals, actively reaching out to these home birth midwives to make for a better system. So I, I applaud that. Maybe we can use that if they're doing, using a different model. Um, and, and I know that the midwives are happy to reach out. One big gigantic issue I saw in the rules right now um, is that, so in the previous draft under this rule number, it said that for VBACs, breach, and multiples, they would have to do these certain things. They would have to um, write an, a, say where they're going to transfer. That's fine. Midwives do that for every client. But also that they'd have to notify the hospital, coordinate with emerging medical services, and the big huge thing is that birth within a hospital of 25 minutes. I consider that acceptable if it's going to be for VBAC breach and multiples. I can deal, I can, I can understand that 25 mile thing, but in this new draft, it's not written that way, and it now says for, for all clients that they have to be within 25 minutes of a hospital, and if the point of the bill is to look at it, expanding the scope of practice, that is not that's not doing that anymore. It's not. It's taking away. You know, we're, and if we're looking at these rural people, it's taking away another option for them. And like I said, I can I can see that for some of the other things like breach multiples and and VBAC, but just as a standard for all clients, it's a little it's um, a little more. So um, I just want to go over some things with VBAC and just look at what you guys are suggesting, what the department's suggesting right now. You know, and you guys have the, um, on the department's website, you have the link for where I got this information from. But in 2011, there are 26 states that allowed CPMs to go to do home births. And of those, only 19 have um, regulations that actually allow home births, and four do not allow home births at all, and, and, that, and we're included in that. So 10 of the 19 states have very, very minimal requirements. I think it's eight, or maybe seven of them don't actually have any requirements at all. Some of them are just, you know, just a low transverse incision. Um, what, you know, one of them is 30 minutes to the hospital. And I just want to make sure that we're creating, if we're going to allow this, I want to make sure that there's parameters that actually make it possible and not that it's just in there or it's kind of a waste of time. Um, but, you know, one thing that NARM says is when consumers experience licensure of midwives as a mechanism to restrict their choices among care options that support physiological birth, they are more likely to seek unlicensed midwives. And I think that's something that we've said from the beginning as consumers is that we want to make sure that there's somebody there to care for these people. Um, so some of the things I thought maybe we can c include and, you know, not necessarily all of them or just some of them and really you guys have already suggested most of these and so I think that's good is that there is some sort of limit to how far you can be from the hospital, which is what you had in the previous dra draft just for VBAC, um, that there's 18 months between the previous C-section and current due date, there's the low transverse scar, um, a written transport plan. Maybe instead of calling ahead, that was something in the emergency plan. I just don't know how that, that will work, and maybe it's a great idea, but I just don't know how that would work for a hospital and, and the licensed midwife to actually call ahead. But um, an ultrasound to determine placental position, an informed consent on file, all those things are things that you guys have already looked at, I mean, suggested, and um, that, are, that are, are in other states' rules as well. Um, an exclusion from the rules, um, one thing it, that you have in there right now is that there's, it can't be more than one previous cesarean section. Only five of the 19 states actually recommend this. And maybe we need to just wait and see what U of A says about that. They might have some good evidence to show that because like everything, I've seen conflicting research on that. Um, the biggest thing, if I stopped right now, I hope I can get across this point, is that for VBAC, if we leave in that a mom can not have documented that her C-section was for failure to progress or failure to dilate, it is going to severely limit the women who are allowed to have a VBAC because I wish I knew the statistic, but I didn't have time to look it up. But that is a huge reason for a lot of moms to have a VBAC. Um, there can be so many, all that definition says is that the baby didn't come out. It doesn't tell us why the baby didn't come out. So it could be so many different reasons. They could have failure to progress because baby was in a bad position. That doesn't mean that will happen the next time. It could be 
be because mom's just struggling emotionally for whatever reason. That doesn't mean she can't work on that and get past that for the next one. It could be, you know, poor positioning from a mom. It could be a failed induction. It, there's just a lot of variety of reasons. And it, it will, if you left it in there, it will exclude the majority of VBAC moms. Um, and then it also has in there for CPD. Um, that's just, you know, it's kind of one of those other things that's difficult to diagnose. Um, and, it, and research is sh showing us that it's not a true indicator that you should uh, have an automatic C-section the next time. Um, and then another thing I think we should look at and wait till U of A maybe gives us some more information on this is just that it, right now it says you can't have a C, you can't have a VBAC if you had a previous uterine infection. I think maybe we can get a little more research on that. Um, a big thing right now in the rules it says that VBAC breach and multiples will not be effective until July 2014. I think we can seriously look at that and maybe work on that date a little bit. I'm wondering if it's because you know you guys want to do more education, things like that. Um, education is great, <clears throat> and I think it could help. Um, but let's just make sure that um, we understand if if NARM is going to be the the testing body, then we have to remember that NARM already meets the minimal requirements for the for for VBAC and multiples and breach. So if we're going to base things off of NARM, we should go on their suggestions. Um, just a quick thing on breach. We, we have a couple options on breach. I mean, we have a couple options on everything. But we could just leave breach as it is. Right now it's a consult. And of course, that leads to a whole array of issues and um, limits a lot of people. But it it's still a possibility. Um, <coughs> another thing is just altering the proposed rules that you guys came up with already, which are not that far from what other states are already requiring. So it's really not, it's not a far stretch. And something we can, si can consider, and I probably should switch my breach and twins um, slides, but if we put, <coughs> if we, um, if we just change the wording right now, it says that you can't do breach if you have multiple, if you have two babies. And um, maybe if we just changed it so that the presenting baby needs to be vertex and the, the second baby could be breach, um, that, might, that might help. Um, and maybe omitting the exclusion for a woman with a pre previous cesarean section and look to see what U of A says about that because, again, there's conflicting evidence on that. Um, Multiple is kind of the same thing. It's it, I think a lot of the stuff that you guys already put in the rules is 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 consistent with what other states are doing. One thing I would consider is that right now it says that um, it could be between 37 and 41 weeks, but we know that twins usually de uh, they develop and they mature quicker, especially in their lungs. So if if for a singleton baby we can our midwives can deliver at 36, then it kind of makes sense to leave it at 36 if if twins fare better when they're younger. <coughs> um, and, and then right now it says both babies need to be in the vertex position and it, you know if we kind of look at what, what they do in the hospitals for those who do twin births it, ba baby A, the presenting baby just needs to be in the head down position and then baby B can be breached so maybe we can work on something like that um, just to kind of finish up, this is my last additional comment, which is kind of huge it's actually not very small at all you can just put it all up there so in the licensing part for midwives in their initial license and their um, renewal of license, and I know we talked about this in the second meeting and it seemed like there was an understanding, but it's, it's, still, in the, um, it's still in the draft, so I'm a little concerned. Right now it says that the midwives have to have write down in their license who they're going, what hospital they're going to transfer to, which we talked about. It's just not, it, it's just, it doesn't make sense because if my midwife is based out of Tempe and she likes the hospital in Tempe, but I live all the way in like Queen Creek, I don't want to transfer to that Tempe hospital because that would be a really bad choice. And um, for the, the other bigger, even bigger concern is that right now, it, you know, it says that there would be a, um, they have to have a physician who agrees to assume care for the client who needs services outside the midwifery scope of practice. Um, I, we've talked about this kind of with the consult that that is going to be next to impossible to get for a midwife to get that because um, there's issues for the doctors for liability insurance and you know just as a consumer if my midwife has somebody that I actually don't really like for whatever reason I, am I then going to be forced to go to that doctor 
I don't, and that just doesn't really work. But regardless of whether or not I like it or not, I don't think a midwife will ever be able to get that. And so that, that's a major, major concern because whether I like the doctor or not, or not, if she can't get that, then she's not going to be able to get her license. And if there, don't, she can't get her license, then I can't have a home birth. So I think that is gigantic. And I, I'm not sure how to fix that, except to say to strike it. <laughs> Chicken, please. <coughs> so. Chicken, please. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, well, it took away my last slide. <laughs> I don't know, it got mixed in there somewhere. Um, but I just think some points to, that we need to remember is that the point of the bill is to reduce regulatory burden and just to, you know, to keep remembering that every time we say the midwives have to do something else, it's not reducing anything. And you know, that, I think that's just a really big thing. But a, a, a bigger point is that the midwives came up with a great report. It's really, really great and really well written. And there may be things in there that aren't going to work, but there's so much in there that would work. And I would strongly recommend that the department bases their drafts on that. And I know you guys have all this technical stuff you have to fit in there, but um, if we look at what they have, because nobody knows how to be a midwife better than they do. And so if we, if we look at what they've already suggested, I think it will just give us such such a, a smoother way to work this because I, I, am, I don't know anything compared to what they know because they live it every day. So I really hope that that is one of the biggest things that will happen is that the, all of the rules will be, will be based on what they put out. So thank you. Uh, thanks. That was a good presentation. And, uh, uh, really appreciate your perspective. Uh, so let's press ahead then um, to Julie uh, Gonegal, who's going to give a presentation. Um, and you've got you can see the title there: "What Women Want: Studies of Consumer Choice and Midwifery." So take it away. Hello. First off, to begin, um, I'm looking out in the audience today and I'm seeing so many consumer um, t-shirts out there right now. Um, you do, you deserve a round of applause. I wanted to let you know before I even begin that I am intimidated, humbled, and honored to be a voice of the consumers in this, on this committee. And with that said, I'm hoping that I present um, a view of what consumers generally want tonight based on both your comments, um, on, particularly on the website, and national studies showing what consumers are looking for. I was originally tasked tonight to present to you a patient's bill of rights. And a little bit of research reveals there is no such thing. <laughs> there is a proposed patient's bill of rights. And I want to talk to you about what that could look like in the context of home birth and midwifery. So with that said, I started off with three questions. The questions are, who are these women? Who are these women that are seeking home births? Um, the term women is almost disingenuous because as you look at both the studies and the comments, it's not just women who are making these decisions alone. These are familial decisions. These are decisions that people think long and hard and engage their, their peers, their loved ones, their mentors in. Um, what do they want? Um, what are we seeking? What are we seeking in, our, in the scope of practice? And uh, why is it that we want it? So who are these women? Um, when you look at home birth women, you see several statistics. You find out that home births consist of 0.72% of the population that by and large, the women seeking home births are far more likely to be married, they're far more likely to be older, they're th far more likely to be having their third or higher order births. And last, they are disproportionately college educated. A comment on that last point because the, um, the comments overwhelmingly on the website, and I, I think we all agree with this, is that you do not need a college education to make informed healthcare decisions. Um, uh, nevertheless, this was included because to rebut a, a, a previous comment that perhaps women who are seeking home births are doing so because they are not otherwise insured, they are poor, or they, they just don't have any other options. So that's, that's why that's in there. So that's who these women are. Um, what we see when we look at the national trends is that Arizona is right on track with the U.S. average of 0.72% of all of our births being at home. 
So we are exactly on trend. Um, Next, we're seeing that women are educated consumers. More than ever, women are conducting their own research um, about pregnancy and childbirth. In large numbers, they are not seeking, um, they're not asking the questions of their doctor or their midwives anymore. They are increasingly looking to books, they're looking to the internet, and they are finding research and information, primary sources. Um, women are using the internet to research, and this is from the Listening to Mother survey that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, we are finding that women are increasingly using the internet. Of the women that use the internet, they will use it an average of 20 times to seek advice about their pregnancy. Of the women who are considered heavy users of digital content, they, and that compose, that's, that's one in five of us ladies, um, <laughs> they will search online over a hundred times during the course of their pregnancy for, for health related information. So what are these women searching for? How do we know that the information they're getting is good? We know that there's a lot of bad information out there. This is a little bit of independent research. Okay, so this, I think this is really cool. This is from Google. With Google, you can tell how the frequency with which a particular term was searched. And then from there, you can also see the like searches that are performed. Um, they compare searches against each other. So that 100 there by VBAC birth is not a reflection of 100 searches. It is with, um, if that is the max, here's what everything is searched relative to that. To put it a different way, for every 100 searches for VBAC birth, you saw 35 searches for VBAC rupture, 25 for uterine rupture and VBAC, and 55 searches for VBAC risks. By and large, these women are trying to inform themselves as best as possible about what the risks are when they engage in birth. Um, Next, this is more of an aside, this is the, that top line up there is the 100 mark for the search term midwifery. And that is uh, where we stand in 2013. We are by and large exceeding um, the searches ever before that have been performed for that particular word. Although as I, as I you know, practice this slide, I, I learned this might be due into large part in a BBC show um, called <laughs> The Midwife. So strike that slide. <laughs> okay, so what women want. Here, is, here are the comments that we're seeing at the website. A woman should be able to make choices about her birthplace and attendance, just as she does about all other major events in her life. Please allow us to make educated choices for us and our families. Women seeking VBAC outside of the hospital are some of the most educated about birth I've met. Let's trust that, that their choice pr in provider is right for them and allow access to that care. And last, it is obvious that everyone involved wants what is best for mothers and babies. These are just a few of my favorite comments. I want to talk about what those mean and how those are indicative of nationwide trends. Um, by and large, oh, just to, just to back up, the overriding theme in almost all of these comments that are put out from consumers are that they are seeking freedom, they are seeking options, they want to be able to decide when and where and with whom to birth. So with that said, here are the major points that would compose a, a, a patient's bill of rights with respect to midwifery. So what women want, they want access to VBACs. Um, there was a, an extremely large survey that was done um, called Listening to Mothers. Many of you might be familiar with it. They sur surveyed over 1,500 moms who gave birth in 2005. Um, here's some of the results of what they found about access to VBACs. They asked women with a previous cesarean about their decision making relating to VBACs and found that 45% were, in, were interested in the option of a VBAC, but that the clear majority who had had a previous cesarean were interested in that option and denied one. We have an access issue when it comes to vaginal birth after cesarean. This is indicative of a, a larger trend. While these are nationwide figures, the trend is true in Arizona as well. If you look over listening to mothers too, the additional piece of information that you find is that the top two reasons for being denied a VBAC are the inability for the hospital, or the, the hospital declining to service uh, VBAC women, or an inability of provider to provide that service as well. So these are doctors and hospitals making these decisions, not, not women deciding for some other reason, by and large. So what women want, Women of rural Arizona in particular face significant obstacles in getting a VBAC. 27.6% uh, of all babies born in Arizona were born by cesarean section. And meanwhile, our VBAC rate in Arizona remains a steady 5.9%. There's a market for this service. VBACs, 
VBACs tend to be safe and effective and women in Arizona are not able to get them, um, particularly when we talk about women who live in rural areas, women whose hospitals either don't support it for a particular reason or women whose providers are unable to, to uh, support their wishes for a VBAC. So what women want, this would also be part of the patient's bill of rights. They want to see the provider of their choice. They want to birth in the location of their choice. And here's how we know this. There was a, another rather large study, although much, smart, much smaller than listening to mothers, that surveyed 160 women who had recently given birth um, at home under the care of a midwife. The study was performed in 2009. And here's what they found. They, these, are the, these are the top reasons. Um, they found that over 35% of women were staying home because they felt they would have a better outcome at home. They found that almost that same number were staying home because they felt it was intervention free. They felt that they were going to be less likely to be, to be pressured into an intervention or have one offered to them if they were at home. Similarly, um, a, approximately the same number reported a negative previous hospital experience or reported increased um, feelings of control when they were birthing at home. Women, um, and a lot of these kind of overlap, but they also reported that they wanted to birth in a comfortable environment, they wanted privacy, they trusted in birth, they were birthing with their preferred caregiver in their preferred setting, that they had options, that they had a drug-free natural birth with family involvement, which is exactly what they were seeking. Um, I'm going to mention a few of the, the top reasons um, I'd also like to mention one that's further down the bottom that just didn't, didn't make this. Um, births at home with midwives cost a heck of a lot less. Um, cost is not typically something that's, that's been mentioned in this committee, and I want to bring it to everyone's attention, um, that, that cost for, for some women enters into, enters into the equation. When you have a hospital birth and are looking at a bill and a baby starting life, $40,000 in debt, um, via cesarean section, a, a at-home VBAC looks a lot more appealing. So let's, um, oh yeah, those are the ones I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna hit safety, I'm gonna talk about control, and then I wanna talk about caregivers. So with respect to safety, <laughs> with the number one concern of women, women believe that the absolute risk associated with home birth is low. This is a comment from the website. We met with a licensed midwife and came to the conclusion that a home birth was the safest choice for us. This past September, I gave birth to my second daughter in my home with not one complication. Um, oh, back up for a second. Um, to, to this note, I also, uh, some praise needs to be doled out to the Arizona Department of Health Services who has put together probably the largest compendium of knowledge that we have integrating all of the studies that have come to their attention and posting it to the public. Um, Arizona has become a model in this respect to, to other states and women um, seeking home births. So thank you, thank you all so much for that and, and contributing to that. Um, and by and large, what these women are seeing when they're reading these studies, and I'm particularly referencing the Johnson study, which, which is the largest prospective study that we have of the safety and efficacy of home birth, um, which found that the overall risk was, was incredibly low and comparable to a hospital birth. So that's one reason why women are choosing home birth. I'm going to talk about control next. Um, this, is this is a graphic that is included in Listening to Mothers 2 um, that talks about the use of interventions. What we find is that women, by and large, are, are having these interventions, interventions that they are in, indeed most of the time consenting to, but at times perhaps, um, and in fact this is what the study shows, that they feel, they feel pressured into many of those interventions. Um, but at home, when they feel that they're not going to be pressured in that way, or in fact that the, the patient um, doctor, patient midwife um, control dynamic is, is a little bit switched because, of, because they feel in control. They, they feel that they're in their own territory. They don't feel like they're going to be making these decisions. So these are, um, this is the graphic from um, Listening to Mothers 2. Oh, I'm sorry, that needs to be said. Um, first time mothers are on the left, second time mothers are, are in the right. Or second or more, sorry. Yeah, thank you. And this is another graphic that was taken from listening to mothers too. These are, are feelings that, that women have when they, when they give birth. Um, and if, if you'll notice that for um, instances of, of vaginal birth, um, the number one feeling is uh, alert, followed by overwhelmed, 
followed by capable, confident, frightened, calm. And you see as the, as the list goes on that there is, um, there's a host of uncomfortable feelings associated up there. Which, may, which you know, maybe, maybe birth is uncomfortable and we need to, to be addressing those. Um, but one of the things that's come up again and again in the comments here is that women who give birth at home aren't feeling that way. Over and over again, what you've said on the website is that when you give birth at home, you feel confident, you feel empowered, you feel like you've been listened to, you feel like you've made the appropriate choices, you feel like you went into the situation educated, and even if you didn't get the result that you wanted, you feel like you've been listened to. And that's one of the reasons that by and large women are, are seeking home births. I'll go to the next one. So I want to finish with, this is my favorite comment from the website and I hope this mama is in the audience tonight. As a woman and a mother, I trust other women to make the right birth choice for them. I believe that birth choice is a fundamental right implicating parental authority, bodily integrity, and freedom of movement. My choice to birth at home was an extremely educated one. I knew the risks and the benefits of birthing at home and at a hospital and made what was ultimately the best choice for me and more importantly, my baby. To be born naturally surrounded by love is what all humans deserve. So in conclusion, um, I read each and every one of your comments online, each and every one of them, and I was absolutely moved to tears by the, the stories that I heard. Um, in almost every uh, s section of comments, there was a woman who indicated that this right was so important to her that, that she would go to, I don't want to say extremes, but maybe I should, to seek that right. Um, there was, and I'm specifically thinking now of a woman who moved all the way to California so that she could get the at-home VBAC that she wanted. We should not be forcing educated women who want to make this decision out of state to get what they want. I was thinking of another woman who is currently uh, measuring large for dates, who may think that she is pregnant with twins, who is currently not having an ultrasound because she does not want to be removed from her midwife's care. She trusts her midwife that much. What we are asking for today is a, a I think, a fairly fundamental right. Um, the right to be able to choose our provider and to choose when and how and with whom we birth. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to me. Thanks. Um, nice job. Uh, good job. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so we have our new member, Janice, is going to give us a presentation from the nurse midwife perspective. So we have 25 minutes for this till about 6.10. Yes, and for us, we have four certified nurse midwives that are sharing this presentation with me. And Tom, if you don't mind, we're going to come up there. Okay, there you go. And I'm going to give this back to you because I think we'll like this better. You good? All right, thank you. 25 minutes. Allison and Julie, those were excellent, excellent presentations. I loved hearing from those uh, comments. And uh, I think you're going to be presently, uh, pleasantly, presently surprised, I hope, that you will see that we agree with a lot of those things. So um, my colleagues and I represent the local certified nurse midwives in Arizona. And we are members of the, oh, our slide. I guess I go here. There it is. Okay, um, so my colleagues and I represent the local certified nurse midwives in the area, and we are members of the American College of Nurse Midwives in the state of Arizona. We thank the board, we thank the committee, we thank uh, Arizona Department of Health Services and the audience for this opportunity to speak with you today. So my name is Janice Beauvais. I'm a full-time nurse midwife in the Gilbert Chandler area. I attend births at Mercy Gilbert Hospital and at Chandler Regional Hospital. Not good enough. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. Well, oh, that might work. Thank you. Okay. So I do births at Mercy Gilbert Hospital and Chandler Regional Hospital. I'm in a large nurse and a large. Um, OBGYN uh, office and there are five full-time nurse midwives in our office. 
As local members of the American College of Nurse Midwives, we welcome and recognize the licensed and professional non-nurse midwives in their quest for providing quality care for the women, mothers, and babies of the state of Arizona. So let me explain a little bit about what, uh, who we are. The Arizona State Board of Nursing regulates advanced practice nurses. Certified nurse midwives are advanced practice nurses. According to the American College of Nurse, uh, uh, Amer the Arizona State Board of Nursing, there are four categories of advanced practice nurse. One is nurse practitioners in all specialties, certified nurse anesthetist, cert a clinical nurse specialist, and certified nurse midwives. So as a certified nurse midwife, we are regulated by both the Arizona State Department, uh, State Board of Nursing and the American College of Nurse Midwives. A graduate degree is required for licensure as an advanced practice nurse, which means a doctorate or master's degree in nursing or associated field. According to the, Ameri to the Arizona State Board of Nursing, there are currently 206 certified nurse midwives in the state of Arizona. And according to the Arizona Department of Health, there are currently 65 licensed midwives in the state of Arizona. In the United States, certified nurse midwives provide care for approximately 11% of all births nationwide. Of those 11%, 96% are in the hospital setting. 2% are in freestanding birth centers, and 1.7% are in a home setting. At this time, the practice that I'm in at Mercy Gilbert Hospital, there are several other nurse midwives there, and as of last month, we attended 24% of all the births in Mercy Gilbert Hospital. Our VBAC success rate at Mercy Gilbert Hospital, I'm very happy to say, because we have very supportive physicians, is 85%. We're very happy about that. I loved hearing about those studies, and I'll be talking to you about those things. <laughs> so, there are uh, some differences between a certified nurse midwife and a licensed midwife or a certified professional midwife, and those are primarily educational differences. But what we have in common, we have a very common thing, and that is the midwifery model of care. And we share this philosophy that you already talked about. So according to the American College of Nurse Midwives, we affirm the power and strength of women and the importance of their self-determination and active participation in the care of themselves, their babies, and their families. We believe that every woman should have options for the childbirth experience she desires. She has a right to choose her provider and her location of birth. Hear, hear. We believe that all women deserve qualified, skilled, and compassionate health care providers. Likewise, they deserve excellent care in a safe environment of their choice. We honor normalcy. We believe in, wait, in wait, uh, watchful waiting and non-intervention in normal processes. We believe in the strong emotional and spiritual effects of childbearing on the woman and on the human race worldwide. In addition, the American College of Nurse Midwives believes in the appropriate use of interventions and technical for, uh, and current for current or potential health problems. We believe in seamless consultation, collaboration, and referral to other members of the healthcare team, such as physicians, as needed to provide optimal care to mothers and babies. We value formal provider education and lifelong learning and development in the application of research to guide ethical and competent midwifery practice. So, in 2012, there was a large meeting putting together all the midwifery organizations in the United States. And the United States is very different with the word midwife as it, uh, different than it is throughout the world. Throughout the world in Canada, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and throughout Europe, the word midwife means midwife means midwife. They, she or he is educated the same, credentialed the same, has the same um, uh, work, etc. And that's the way it's done throughout the world. But in the United States, there are different 
categories of the word midwife, and we all know that. Lay midwife, which has no formal education, which is considered illegal in most parts of the United States, well, it is. Licensed midwife, uh, certified professional midwives, which is who you are, and certified nurse midwives. So the word midwife means different things in the United States. There was a consensus, a big meeting where we all got together. And the groups that were there were the American College of Nurse Midwives, the Midwives Alliance of North America, and the National Association of Certified Professional Midwives. They all got together to define and describe what is normal physiologic birth. And normal is, this is what they came up with, Normal childbirth is spontaneous and onset, uh, ends in a normal vaginal birth, there's normal blood loss, and it promotes breastfeeding with direct skin-to-skin -skin contact immediately or soon after birth. Also, according to the World Health Organization, normal childbirth is described as spontaneous ons and onset, low risk at the start of labor, and remains low risk throughout labor, birth, and the immediate postpartum. So what we're recommending, we're recommending, um, number one, that licensed midwives and CPMs remain experts of normal. And when you come across complications in pregnancy, labor, or birth, that you transfer care to certified nurse midwives and physicians and or physicians as complications arise. Document and publish your outcomes and research and results to provide better um, um, to provide valuable research for evidence-based practice and obtain formal standardized training, continued education, and quality assurance such as peer review and professional regulation to ensure mother and baby safety. And of course the informed consent, you guys are all over that. We're happy that. Now I'm going to add something to my slide that I heard today. I'm asking the medical community in the state of Arizona to listen to what we just heard today about what women want, what they want for their home birth options, and what they need from us in the hospital. So if the medical community is going to recommend that we do not allow, or whatever, licensed midwives to do V-backs, twins, and breaches, then I recommend that in our medical establishments that we look at that and try to make a difference for that. Now, I'd like to thank you. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Lucy Hosmer. Thank you, Janice. Um, I'm a certified nurse midwife in Phoenix, and I currently attend births at Maricopa Medical Center. I also provide outpatient services at multiple clinic sites throughout Phoenix through the Maricopa Integrated Health System. And tonight, I'd like to provide a brief overview of evidence-based practice, commonly known as EBP. EBP has become the new mantra in healthcare. But what is it, why is it, and what does it have to do with a licensed midwifery role? EBP is relevant because the term evidence has frequently been used when discussing scope of practice. And we've heard it tonight as well. So what is evidence-based practice? EBP is a conceptual model of care that demonstrates how evidence from good research can be integrated into clinical practice. The important goal of EBP is to improve patient outcomes. EBP was introduced in 1996 by Hayes and has been adapted by all major health disciplines. The Institute of Medicine has named EBP a core competency for all health providers. It is also endorsed by the National Institute of Health. This model integrates four components of care. The best available evidence, practitioner expertise, the client's preference, and available resources. So you might ask, how does this model differ from what we've always done? I'll start with a brief overview of how decisions were made in healthcare before EBP. Knowledge and competence came from many sources. Individuals learned from one another, and those with the most experience became the experts. They published their opinions in books, which became an additional resource. Clinical trials were conducted to determine cause, prevention, and treatment. 
Remember, trials have been along, around for a long time. In the 1700s, the discovery that citrus or vitamin C could prevent scurvy was made by comparing two groups of sailors. Both ate the same diet, but one group was supplemented with citrus. So clinical trials have become more sophisticated over time and far more abundant. The volume of information has become overwhelming. And now the, inter the internet provides access to all this information to us. So we are really challenged in how to make sense of all this information. EBP provides a framework for us to do this. It assists us in integrating research into practice. It's comprised of four components of care, and it is at the intersection of these components where best outcomes occur. The first component, best evidence, is obtained after performing a critical review of the literature and selecting studies with the highest level of evidence. The second component is practitioner expertise. Different types of training provide different levels of competence for specific conditions. While a family practice doctor can evaluate your blood pressure and prescribe an antihypertensive, oh, would you do this for me? Thank you. Um, if you're in a cardiac crisis, you need a cardiac cath and stent placement, you'll be transferred to a specialist for care, even if the family practice doctor is well read on the procedure, has seen it, has even assisted with the procedure while in training. So although a cardiologist and family practice doc are both physicians, their training and skill sets are vastly different. When evaluating studies, it is important to match the provider training in the study to providers who will deliver the care in question. The third component is available resources. We are all aware that hospital and home birth settings have different resources available for managing complications. This is particularly important for high-risk patients who may need time-critical interventions to provide safe outcomes should they have a ruptured uterus or a trapped head with a breach. The fourth component is client preference. Clients discuss their values and preferences with their provider. The provider integrates the four components. It is the intersection or overlap of these four components that define EBP. Again, this is where best outcomes occur. EBP, therefore, does not mean that, a client, that client preference is disregarded, nor does it mean that it alone drives the care that's provided. Our, recommend, our recommendations is that Arizona licensed midwives integrate EBP into their practice. Knowledge is power. Licensed midwives should know best practices in the field of OBGYN. They need to know the science that anchors these practices. They should also know their own outcomes. Therefore, we support continued use of the quarterly report forms. We need to be able to compare Arizona birth, home birth outcomes to the evidence in the literature. We need to trend Arizona outcomes over time to ensure public safety and identify unexpected trends. Therefore, we recommend additional resources be made available to the state for improving compliance in accurate and complete reporting of this data. We recommend a collaborative effort between the Department of Health Services and an academic affiliate to assist with routine analysis of the data at regular intervals. Our last recommendation is to publish this data since there's a very small handful of studies on the outcomes of licensed midwives. And now I'd like to pass, pass uh, the microphone to another colleague of mine, Dr. Lynn Kennedy. Good evening. I um, also work out of uh, Maricopa Integrated Health System, and I see clients in four separate clinics throughout the greater Phoenix area and attend births at Maricopa Medical Center. I am in full scope midwifery. I'm briefly going to talk to you about what is high risk and who should be doing high risk. A pregnancy um, in which some condition puts the mother, the baby, or both at risk sometime during 
the um, pregnancy, the labor and delivery, or the postpartum period is considered high risk. Vaginal birth after cesarean, which we refer to as VBAC, is the accomplishment. Having the labor is what we call TOLAC or trial of labor after cesarean. So um, the risk for VBAC trial of, or the trial of labor are 20 to 40 percent require a repeat C-section for one reason or another. Um, it could be field distress or um, failure to progress or some condition that does not allow the um, trial of labor to continue. Prior cesarean sections or other uterine surgeries are factors most often associated with abnormal placenta implantation. And it can result in placenta accreta, percreta, or increta. And what this means is the placenta, instead of attaching to the wall of the uterus, actually penetrates through the uterus to attach or could attach to other organs such as the bladder. Um, the uterine rupture, as demonstrated in this slide, can be a catastrophic event for both mother and fetus, often resulting in a 500 to 2,000 milliliter of rapid blood loss. Maternal morbidity and mortality associated with uterine rupture accounts for 5% of all maternal deaths each year. So what are our recommendations? VBAC is recommended by the World Health Organization, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the American College of Nurse Midwifery, the, and VBAC.com. They all concur that women should be allowed to VBAC, but in an environment with emergency surgical rescue immediately available. For breech delivery, I'd like to point out that the biggest part of the baby is usually the head. If the head fits through the mother's pelvis, usually the body will follow quite rapidly. If the baby is born bottom first, it is possible that the body will fit through, but the, mother's, but the baby's head will be trapped in the mother's pelvis. This is called trapped head at the chin level. An umbilical cord prolapse may occur particularly with the complete foot lean breach or the kneeling breach. This is caused by the lowermost part of the baby's body not completely filling the space of the dilated cervix. Oxygen deprivation can occur from a cord prolapse and, or prolonged um, compression from a trapped head. This results in fetal hypoxia anoxia and could result in fetal death. So for a breech birth, our recommendation is that a provider skilled and experienced in vaginal breech delivery is present at each birth. The hospital operating room is immediately available for emergency cesarean delivery if required. Overall, the large studies have confirmed that elective cesarean section has lower risk to the fetus and only a slight increase to the mother. This increased risk would involve a non-catastrophic bleeding, infection, or wound healing problems. Very similar to cutting your finger in the kitchen. For twin pregnancies, you have the same risk of infection and bleeding and wound healing if you cut your finger as a surgery. A twin pregnancy is a high-risk pregnancy associated with significant increase in maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. In the pregnancy state or the antepartum period, a twin pregnancy is at risk for hyperemesis, anemia, polyhydramnios, gestational diabetes, um, antepartum hemorrhage, and they're at the highest risk level for preterm delivery. During the labor and birth period, Pre, uh, twin pregnancy can have premature rupture of membranes. Babies are uh, low birth weight. It can have a postpartum hemorrhage from the uterus being over distended or malpresentation of the second twin resulting in a birth, 
breach or transverse presentation, or a cord prolapse. So we recommend that um, management of the antepartum and intrapartum complications of uh, twin pregnancies will reduce the morbidity and mortality and improve the outcomes for twins. Now I'm going to talk about competency. Who is competent to do high-risk pregnancy? A competency is a, has a defined, excuse me, a standard of competency is defined by clear statements for successful performance. It involves understanding the procedure, your personal traits and behaviors, your skills, and your innate abilities. An example of a competency is everyone who wants to drive a car is required to take the same driving and written test. Upon successful completion, you are a competent novice. In 2011, the American College of Nurse Midwives did a study on the comparison between certified nurse midwives and certified professional midwives or licensed midwives. And this is what they came. Both have professional certifying organizations and both have professional um, organizations that they um, subscribe to. A CNM attends an accredited university and the LM or CPM obtains their education through NARM or their portfolio evaluation process. The educational requirements are distinctly different. A degree program provides extensive scientific and statistic education. This provides a deeper understanding of the scientific underpinnings that support health practices. This education provides the tools needed for a literature search and critical appraisal of the studies to determine the best evidence that apply and apply that evidence to your clinical practice. A CNM is granted an advanced degree, either a master's or a doctorate, and there is no degree available through the portfolio evaluation process. However, I do understand that um, licensed midwives, many do have various degrees and there are some um, educational facilities that are not accredited yet. Um, they CN actually are accredited. They are? That was not in my research, so thank you very much. Um, CNMs are licensed to practice in all jurisdictions, and the LMs are regulated in 20 states by means determined by the state regulating them. CNMs have prescriptive authority in all jurisdictions, and LMs to date have no prescriptive authority. So the key points that we would like to make um, our accountability is assuming responsibility for one's own practice. It's a legal obligation and an ethical and moral responsibility. A licensed midwife has the legal obligation to practice within their scope as defined in the Arizona statute. The statute defines expected, acceptable behaviors and consequences for noncompliance. It is essential to set clear expectations for professional behavior and it is an expectation that professional behavior of the licensed midwife that they report all birth data and that the Arizona Department of Health Services oversees that data and assures compliance with the statute. The current regulation states a midwife shall provide care only to clients determined to be low risk. Thank you. I'd like to introduce my colleague Brittany Hamilton. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Brittany Hamilton. I'm a certified nurse midwife in private practice in uh, Phoenix. I attend births at St. Joseph's Hospital and Phoenix Baptist Hospital. Uh, today I'll be speaking on prescriptive authority. Uh, currently in Arizona, there's nine healthcare professions with prescriptive authority. Uh, they are physicians of medicine and osteopathy, physicians assistants, advanced nurse practitioners, which we know include certified nurse midwives, naturopathic doctors, podiatrists, optometrists, veterinarians, and dentists. How prescriptive authority is governed uh, is varies from state to state. 
Certified nurse midwives have prescriptive authority in all states, and in Arizona, this authority is granted by the State Board of Nursing. In other states, it is under the uh, in other states, it is under the um, oh, excuse me. In Arizona, the authority to practice um, authority for prescriptive authority is granted by the State Board of Nursing. In other states, it may be under the State Board of Medicine. In Arizona, providers with prescriptive authority have received graduate level training from accredited programs. Each specialty area is regulated by their own professional board. Currently, no state grants prescriptive privileges to certified professional midwives or licensed midwives. We have a, here is a list of the common medications used by licensed midwives. Oxygen, Pitocin, Rogam, Vitamin K, and Erythromycin. Uh, the Arizona statute states, a midwife shall not administer drugs or medications except Rogam and Vitamin K under physician's written orders. The statute allows licensed midwives to emergently administer Pitocin to mothers and oxygen to mothers and infants if needed. We are concerned that expanding the list may cause an unnecessary delay in high-risk patients being transferred to a higher level of medical care. Additional medications infer that the process of birth has deviated from normal and is in need of medical attention. The art of midwifery is recognizing when the birth process deviates from normal and becomes high risk, not how long the patient can stay home. In conclusion, every family has the right to experience childbirth in an environment where human dignity, self-determination, and the family's cultural context are respected. We must work harder to provide a seamless transfer of care when it is needed. Thank you. I just have to comment. I think the nurse, certified nurse midwives did a great job on informed consent on uh, VBAC breaches and twins. Um, so if we fully wanted to inform a consumer, um, they could reference this video. Okay, I've asked for 20 minutes and I think I'm going to do it a lot less. What I'd like to do is build a little bit on what all the previous speakers have What I want to talk about real quickly is the experience of the Arizona Perinatal Trust for four decades in Arizona. The trust began in the 70s. Arizona's horrible neonatal mortality rate in the 50s and 60s. We ranked actually 47th. Um, 35 years later, we're ranked 21st. Um, in 2008, the last year that we have uh, statistics for. So Arizona went from the lowest quartile in the 1950s to the highest quartile in the 1970s. We slipped a little, but the gap between 21st and 6th, which we were at one point, um, is not very great. So how'd that happen? Arizona led the nation in shifting the delivery of risk babies and Thank you, uh, I think it was Lynn that gave us a good overview of what risk means. But we, should, we led, the, led the nation in shifting deliveries of at-risk babies to facilities appropriate to their anticipated needs. So what's that mean? I work and live in Cholo. We don't deliver 26-weekers and see how they do and then put them on a helicopter and airplane. We send a mom to a level three hospital that's capable of dealing with 26-week babies. So to the, the proof of concept was in 1975, we were sending about twice as many babies as we sent last two years. So we're sending more moms. Moms make a much better ambulance than an ambulance. On the other hand, our maternal transports, which were non-existent in 1975, uh, went up to 10 per thousand deliveries. So we've been very effective. And that is how we've reduced the neonatal and maternal morbidity and mortality in Arizona. So this concept has been validated in Canada and other places. So the conclusion is that there is very clear evidence, and we talked about um, evidence-based practice, there's very clear evidence that infants at risk do better when they're delivered in an environment appropriate for their anticipated needs, not delivered remotely and then sent to the hospital when there's a problem. So, that's evidence. 
There is no evidence, especially in Arizona, that delivering at risk infants remote from available resources in Arizona is appropriate. You'll notice I'm, st I'm sticking to Arizona. What works in Arizona doesn't necessarily work somewhere else. And what works somewhere else doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in Arizona. So I'm talking about Arizona data. What we have is <coughs> excuse me, Arizona data, and I would like to see some more of that. Now, one thing that Mary Ellen, who could not be here, she's in Washington. One thing that Mary Ellen wanted <coughs> to make sure that everybody was aware of is that we've got a great perinatal transport system, one of the best in the country. But unfortunately, when we're transporting, we're not treating. We're just transporting. The, the best in EMT, the best that our neonatal nurse practitioners on the uh, helicopters and airplanes, the best they can do is stabilize. They don't have lab. They don't have all the uh, equipment that they need to help these infants uh, respond and get better. So transport is not the answer. The answer is getting them to a center. So having said that, and listen to um, the previous speakers, I'd like to suggest for the committee a roadmap that to me makes sense. Maybe it doesn't make any sense to anybody else, but I'd like to suggest it anyway. I'd like to recommend that we pause for a period of time, and there's a reason I chose 24 to 36 months, you'll see in a minute, and just pause on the expanding of the scope of practice. And the reason, and then what we do during the next 24 to 36 months and for the committee until July, is we concentrate on four things. One is standardize the requirements and processes that haven't been looked at for years. Right now we have no peer review. We have very poor data. We have data that doesn't tell us anything. Uh, so standardize the requirements and the processes. Um, one of the problems with the data collection in four years from 07 to 11, the information that we were given last week, or last month, showed that there were 3,118 home births. 500 were normal, one abnormal, nobody expired. But look at how many, 84% of the outcomes on mothers is absent from the data. We don't know. We don't know what's going on in Arizona. The vast majority of our maternal in information is missing. The next thing I'd like to see the committee do, with the input of all of our midwives, is to standardize the educational requirements for core privileges. In other words, what the midwives are doing now. Let's make sure that the education and the experience is adequate for the privileges that people have. And then, determine what additional education experience would allow a midwife to request an advancement or an expanded scope of practice. That's how it's done in medicine. That's how it's done in hospitals. We don't go to Bomex or ADHS or anybody else if a doctor comes in and wants to expand their practice or do something. They show training and experience. So we can build that in. That can be built into the regulations for midwifery in Arizona. Thirdly, I'd like to recommend that we collect valid and meaningful Arizona-specific data. S looking at, this is again something that was handed out last month. Look at the second line, APGAR scores, four to, APGAR score of four to six. That's not good for those of you who don't know APGAR scores. It's a measurement of how well the baby's doing. Ten is good, one's bad. Okay, so 141 babies had pretty bad APGARs of four to six, but four minutes later, 10% of them are not recovered. That's not good data. It's numbers, but it doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us, for example, that maybe midwives aren't very good at resuscitating. Or maybe midwives are great at resuscitating, but they don't have the equipment, and if you had a neonatologist at the delivery, it's not gonna resuscitate. That's the kind of data we don't have. That's what we need to be looking at. And finally, and this is probably the most important, it's used this time to establish dialogue between the midwifery community <coughs> and mainstream medicine. Yeah. I have worked with midwives. I have backed midwives. Uh, I would like to see midwives in the hospital setting. I'd rather see them in the hospital setting. And, and helping us to understand what it is that you bring and you, and you have to offer. And you have to offer our patients. Uh, those of you that have been with us from the beginning on the very first meeting remember me relating to you that the 
lowest C-section rate in Arizona is Fort Defiance. It's about 8%. And that's because all the deliveries up there are managed by CNNs. Um, the only uh, deliveries done by the docs are usually the C-sections. So um, I'd like to see that integration uh, occur. All the um, information that's been posted, uh, all the things from Texas and from Seattle or from Washington, <coughs> Canada, Great Britain, Netherlands, they all say the same thing. There's a close collaboration between the medical community and midwives, and that's not here. That's not here in Arizona, but it could be. So that's what I would like to see happen. And that, I think, will get us where we all want to be, which is to arrive at the safest and best practice based on solid evidence for Arizona mothers and babies. Any questions that anybody has on this data that we've got so far? A couple of things just um, to update you. The uh, 2010 data on VBACs was 5.9%. It's much higher in 2012. 22 of the 45 hospitals uh, with elective uh, obstetrical services now do VBACs. So you're seeing VBACs, and I would say by the end of the year, it'll probably be over 30. And that's because of the changing legal climate. And by the way, the VBAC success rate in hospitals in 2012 was 82.4%. And that was on about 1,800 VBACs. So, questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Director Humble. Yeah. Yeah. Since we have a little extra time, there's been something that um, is a really important topic in the midwifery community, and I'm representing the vast majority. And Allison kind of mentioned it earlier in the draft rules about having a physician agreement uh, in the initial licensing application and also the renewal. A lot of midwives have been posting and commenting that this could be the exceptional, eventual um, end of licensed midwifery practice. So we definitely would like to ask that that be stricken from the draft rule in the future draft. Um, you know, just looking at the precedent that was set in the history, um, they had a similar rule that required physician uh, uh, agreement and that at one point in the early 80s, um, in order to comply with the midwifery rules and regulations of that time, it was mandatory for consumers of licensed midwives to be seen by an obstetrician. And during that time this rule was in place, the obstetricians became increasingly concerned with their malpractice liability and that they could be held liable for the outcomes of midwife attended deliveries. That midwifery rule was stricken, I believe, in 1991 due to that issue, as well as a woman's right to choose whether or not she wanted to be seen by a physician. Due to medical liability issues, there was a, a statute, um, an Arizona revised statute titled 12-573, which I mentioned at the last meeting, the limited liability for treatment related to delivery of infants exception definition, which states a physician licensed to practice pursuant to Title 32, Chapter 13, or 17 is not liable to the pregnant female, patient, the child or children delivered, or their families for medical malpractice related to labor or delivery rendered on an emergency basis if the patient was not previously treated for the pregnancy by the physician. So if um, this, sta this statute takes the liability off the physician when we transport to a hospital when there's no prior contact. So if there is an, a, an established agreement or required established agreement between a licensed midwife and a physician that once again would put them um, possibly held liable. And um, you know looking at the effectual end of licensed midwifery practice having these that rule in plate, place gives another profession power and control over licensed midwives ability to practice end of story. Um, the obstetricians can say that they would sign that letter or agreement all they want, but there's no law or rule mandating that they must. I would like to point out the recent uh, American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, there was an article 
um, the professional response, the planned home birth, the professional responsibility response, and this was, is taken from the very first article. They are stating in their article that we call on obstetricians, other concerned physicians, midwives, and other obstetric providers and their professional associations. So it's very obvious that obstetricians do not support planned home birth. They're stating that in their journal. So for us to find a physician to sign an agreement, it's just not going to work. And so I'm definitely asking on the behalf of the vast majority of midwives here in this state to please strike that. Okay, well, um, uh, yeah, thanks for your comment. I heard it uh, loud and clear from the consumer perspective and now um, from you as well. And so let, but let's that we'll get to as part of this agenda item as well. So I mean, we could cover it again briefly, um, but suffice to say it'll be clearly in the minutes and I'll talk to our team uh, later on this week and as we prepare the next iteration. And I, I hear your concerns and your, your worries, but we sat all of about an hour and a half here listening to trying to Your lack of trust that we can get there is, is concerning to me. I mean, what I've heard tonight is we don't want to do this because of barriers. So we, we need to strive to do what's right rather than focus on the barriers. If we and all of you have, you've asked for consideration, you've asked for your consumer rights to be heard, we still need to do what's safe and what's best. We still need to do that. We can't say we have to deliver home VBACs that have had two or three C-sections. You assuming that responsibility suggests safe. Taking this whoever, use an advisory committee, but don't remove the op the 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 opportunity for a patient to have evidence-based communication. I'm sorry, I disagree. So y y you haven't put out another option out there. You want to say, please don't make it be an obstetrician gynecologist because they won't do it. Okay, who else should do it? And and why should it be a midwife? Because you haven't delivered in an environment where you have had to deal with catastrophic events. So as long as, as, as somebody can deem that appropriate, it, you're, you're saying we shouldn't do this because of these barriers. Well, let's, let's try to work to break, break down these barriers. You're not understanding what I'm saying. This is nothing. Let me just clarify this. This, no, this is just not about the expansion. This has nothing to do with the expansion. The expansion of the scope is not our fight. The midwives have not asked for the expansion. We just want our rules revised. That's all we want. We want our rules revised so that we can practice safely and effectively. The consumers ask for the expansion. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking with initial licensing for, newly, for new midwives and for renewal. Currently, right now, I don't need a signed agreement from a phys physician. So why should I have to in, for future? I mean, it's, I've been, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm in my seventh year of practice, and I do not have a signed agreement from a physician. You know, when I renew my license, I state clearly where that, that statement is. Um, I state clearly I go to the closest facility. And I utilize the on-call physician. I'm going to, again, even ask, wouldn't it be better, wouldn't it be better if you felt comfortable that you could communicate beforehand, that you could be part of that delivery as your consumer has requested? If you could be, if we work towards collaboration, I don't hear that. I hear this, I, I, I'm sitting here listening to these presentations and, and recognizing that some individuals desperately would like to deliver at home. I, I understand that. But some of what I heard tonight is foreign to me. Where I deliver, whole families are in the room. Where I deliver, it costs $2,500. 
whole thing, prenatal, hospital costs, the whole nine yards. So it's foreign to me. I don't understand because it's not where I deliver. I deliver in Central Phoenix, and everything that's been presented tonight and requested is available in a safe environment for high-risk pregnancies. Please consider that. Okay, uh, thanks for those comments, and we're, we're trying to stay on track now. Um, so it's 6.30, we've got uh, 40 minutes to go over uh, the set of rules, and I, Tom, you've got some PowerPoint presentations, yeah. uh, some slides to go over with sort of the basics of what's in the rule. You can see in your packet um, this, you know, the latest iteration of the rule changes. And I just want to um, reemphasize for the whole committee, um, and Jess, this is, your, this is your first time here. So uh, the way this process is going to continue to roll out um, is that we're going to continue to work on iterations of these regulations. Um, and then at some point in March, right, we'll have a draft rule for public comment. So what, we, what we're looking at is a working copy. It's not even a draft rule for public comment. It's just sort of a working um, evergreen document. And you've seen some changes over time. Uh, a big thing that's going to uh, one of the things I'll be really looking forward to in the next month or so is we've uh, got a contract with the U of A College of Public Health, Maternal and Child Review the literature and put it in a more concise way for us to sort of, um, A, look at the results from the published literature around the questions that were um, uh, exploring here around scope of practice and other matters. And it, you know, importantly, to look at the strengths of the study, they're using a grade methodology which helps you um, look at the strength. Not all studies are created equal with sample size, statistics, study design, and so forth. So one of the things that we'll be looking forward to from U of A College of Public Health will help us, or at least help me, sort of distill down the differences in the kinds of published studies and the kinds of evidence-based practices. Um, one of the things I took out of the presentations today is something that I feel real passionately about in every aspect of the job, not just as we work on the midwifery scope of practice rules here, but that whatever I've been committed to that for as long as I've been in this job, no matter what the topic, and my staff is probably sick of me asking, what does the evidence show? Because I'm always looking to the literature to find out what is the data show? Because that's the best way, that's one of the one of the key factors to helping really make good effective decisions and whether it's something like this or all the other public policy questions that we're involved with at the state. So, um, so with that, we look forward to getting that report between this meeting and the next uh, scope of practice committee meeting or study committee meeting um, and then we'll have another meeting after that U of A report comes out and then in mid-March we'll have a draft rule for public comment that'll be the official version for folks to weigh in on um, you know what we have in terms of regulation both administrative and scope of practice um, then around um, probably in the May June time frame we'll have a much closer to a final version of uh, the rules and regulations, again, both administrative and scope of practice. And then the goal is to publish the final rules at the end of June. Um, our deadline is July 1st, uh, and, and we would then publish those with the Secretary of State, and that would be the final set of regulations. So that's our sort of the roadmap from where we are in mid-February to, you know, where we'll be uh, by May, and then uh, finally in June when we publish the final scope of pra uh, final regulations. So with that, um, Tom, why don't we go through some of the slides, and um, this is the opportunity for the committee to weigh in as a whole on each of these topics. We've got 40 minutes set aside for this, so we have until about a quarter after if we don't take a break. So we've got a lot of time here. So this is the area where it would be nice to have a good, robust discussion along the lines of what you guys, what y'all just were talking about around um, having a physician sign off um, as part of the regulation. So this is the part where we can really get into the meat and um, uh, you know get into some more detail. All right, yes, these slides are uh, just what Will said is to really uh, initiate some discussion among the group up here. I think I have about eight or 10 slides um, 
the real big picture slides, we're not going to go into details with the language in the rules. We're going to kind of focus on the slides and kind of go from there. Um, first off, is that better? Okay. Um, one of the things that we did uh, change a little bit is the new reporting requirements in form. Um, if you remember the first meeting, we talked about eliminating the quarterly reports. Um, we are going to have electronic submission of certain um, information for a day that we'll actually use. I know uh, there's been some discussion about the data that we've had so far that hasn't been so useful and it's been incomplete. So we're going to address that. And instead of submitting it every quarter, we're going to do, uh, it's going to be required to be submitted within 30 days of <coughs> the services being terminated. Um, that will go into effect July 1st as in the current draft. Just to make a real quick clarification, Tom, the way you're describing, the, the, your sentence structure suggests that this is final. So I just, since we're on TV and everything, <laughs> I want to, and everyone here in the room understands what I just said about how this is a working document. So as you run through this, everything I say is draft. <laughs> That's my disclaimer. Can I just make a comment on the 30 days? Yes. Uh, you know, there's been conflicting information like just over the years with the quarterlies. Um, when, you know, are they due at the end of every quarter? Like, you know how we have the, the thir like September 30th, they're due October 15th, but do we technically have to support, submit the quarterly at that time if we have not done the postpartum visit? So that's kind of been a little bit of confusion there. So that 30 days, if we do a six week postpartum visit, wouldn't fall in that guideline, do you want the postpartum visit included in the quarterly and that information? So that would be something just to think about. Okay. Thank you. I also have a comment about reporting. I don't know if the department has considered using MANA stats, which is our national statistics program, but I know there are several states in the United States that use that as their state reporting. It's excellent, and I do ask for you guys to report. MANA stats, M-A-N-A-S-T-A-T-S. Alliance of North America, mm -hmm. and it's their statistics program. A lot of stats that we've pulled come from that. So is it, do you do, you do electronic live data entry on that? So there's no paper. One of the things we're trying to do with this is, to, we, don't want any more, is we don't want any more paper anywhere in this department, not just midwives. So, it's all electronic. okay, so it's a, this, what you're describing would be 100% electronic and would go into a, a database that is cost free to the midwife. Well, it's part of the license. The CPM. the CPM license would then allow, and then we at the department would be able to access all elements of the data or just, is there tags? There is. It's a huge data stat, and so you can, the department can say, we want stats on this, 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 and this. And so you're, you get basically a data set that you, as the department or as you know, the advisory board, says we want this data from the stat. So, because it's huge. I mean, it's like a six page document of stats if you do the long form. So, a lot is available, but what the state wants, they can just ask. Um, one of the things that I, has come up over the years too about the quarterly and our reporting mechanism, uh, it, it's been budget. You know, I, there's not a lot, I, I understand that over the years our, we have a very small budget for our department and since we're so few that um, that's why I think the quarterly um, isn't the best um, ga data gathering mechanism. That's what's great about Manistats is that somebody else does it and you just get that data. Are all the licensed midwives using that program at this time? No, in fact, it's a very small amount of licensed midwives that are using that right now. So if the state required it, then we would up our numbers. Is it difficult for the licensed midwives to use that program? Not at all. Uh, does it cost you all money to use that program? Nope. Oh, I remember when we were doing our draft rules report for the department, um, we brought up MANA stats, including that, but the concern voiced by some of the midwives, what if for some reason 20 years from now our rules still haven't been revised and we specifically say MANA stats and there is no MANA stat. Kind of like right now if you read our rules, the newborn 
um, screening is definitely outdated and needs to be revised. So that was just one concern the midwives had about that. But if you have a committee, then that won't be a problem anymore. <laughs> well, but you, I mean, you have a good point in the sense that um, this is a this is a pretty resource intensive job on our part to overhaul these regulations, and so our goal is to be able to make sure that it, as we get to the end, we've got something that we can um, be assured isn't we're not going to have. I mean, there's all kinds of things where, like, we license the restaurant inspectors. They're called sanitarians. And we had a thing where their test went away. And so we had to open up. We had to spend a bunch of time to revise regulations because that exam had gone away. So I think it's points well taken. I want to make sure that we protect ourselves from having to redo regulations. Um, on the other hand, if the MassStat's parent organization is stable, that can go... You know, that's a factor that we can consider as, you know, doing this. You know, the, the, the other side of it is, and what you see up on the screen here, is that I can assure you that we will not be requiring, we don't want any paper at all. In fact, we won't, I don't want to even accept paper as any of the reports. Some of the, uh, 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 I think on uh, SurveyMonkey tool that, would allow us to capture some of those data fields just using that organically developed process here. So either whether we use mass stats as part of the administrative requirement or whether we go with something that we develop in-house, um, it's going to be totally electronic and we're going to get a lot better data. It'll be easier to comply um, and we'll get rid of all those sheets of paper um, that are in the files. One more plug, Manistats has been around for nearly 20 years, so I don't know that it's going away anytime soon. The computer needed a break. The <laughs> down on us. Uh, okay, so um, is it going to be? Just going to be a second. Okay, then we don't want to take a break then. Unless, would I mean, y'all want to take a five minute break or just press ahead? They assure me it's just going to be a second to load this back up. No care. I need to be the. Okay. Go through all of them. Can we just click on them on the side? Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Speed reading. Speed reading. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Sure. Okay. When can we start the advisory committee? <laughs> that would so that it's would something be that is something that the Tomorrow? this committee will will talk about and put together. And and I need to understand, can we only talk about things here only here? I can't call these guys later and ask them what do you think? Whoa. Help yeah, me. that I'm glad you mentioned that because we spent our second meeting on the Arizona State I Open heard Meeting a Law. Bit of it, but I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> well, you weren't on the committee exactly. yet. Um, I didn't. So I'll give you a snapshot view of it. But you, you, there's an online training which you're going to have to probably take oh. about it oh. now that you mentioned it. Oh. Um, so this is an Arizona Open Meet. This this meeting is a public body according to state law, which means this every all of our business needs to be conducted in the open, in public. And one of the main reasons for having us Arizona open meeting law is to make sure that folks are assured that there aren't backroom meetings that are happening where the real decisions are being made, that actually the public body is the public body that's making decisions. And so for that reason, um, it's important as you uh, go about your daily business at work that you be very careful about um, you know, what you send on email groups to anybody that's on the committee because it, you can form a quorum very quickly electronically and violate the intent and the spirit of the open meeting law by just trying to gather information. So in some ways the open meeting law makes things more difficult um, f from a getting snappy answers perspective but it's important to stay true to the letter of the open meeting law so that we can, A, make sh reassure everybody that the business is really taking place 
in the open. And so there's been even members of the committee that have wanted to talk to me privately about solutions that they have. And while that's great and they might have really good solutions that would be great to talk to me about, I don't want to violate the open meeting law. So I'm politely saying, let's conduct that business as part of the committee. So, um, and, and we'll get, Tom will get with you on the online version of the training. Okay, so take it away. All right, the current draft version for uh, inform, uh, informed consent. Informed consent is provided by the midwife. Um, if you remember the last draft of rules had the informed consent um, for the high risk areas, the feedback, the breach, the most. So we changed that back to just having the midwife consult with the client. Uh, the informed consent must be maintained in the patient's record. There's two different types of informed cons consent. One is general informed consent, which will apply to in any circumstance for any client. And then an additional one, if it was the higher risk one, the VBAC, the breach, the multiples. And that, like the, the reporting, would go into effect July 1st, 2013. Any comments on that? Did you, oh, did you have just one draft up? Was that your, the one that you guys put up? Was yes. that just the contains, main one? It contains both portions. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I still think for higher risk, you should include a physician consult as they can communicate the complications and some of the procedures that would go along with the complications. For instance, the trapped head and some of the incisions that are required and some of the complications in the hemorrhage and repair. So without, they may not get all that information. Is it, it may come from some of the midwives, but it may not come from all. Tom, um, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you were moving on and going off of the previous slide. Um, on the reporting, going back to that, it, how are you going to enforce that? Obviously, the reporting now is not good. So how do you put teeth into your reporting? It, I think part of the problem in this meeting is that there's a lack of transparency. Not that it was intentional, but there's no data. So to keep from doing that again on July 1st, 2013, what is the department going to do to ensure that the data is collected? Yeah, um, so going to the data quality, I, to be real clear about this, I believe that probably the main reason why we have such poor data right now is that the system that's set up in the current rules is just unmanageable administratively. And so it's not, I don't believe that it's any individual midwife's fault that the data is so incomplete. It's that the administrative process we have I, I, I totally agree with that, yeah, by the way. Right. I, I do agree. No, it's, they're terrible. I don't want to say they're terrible. Shame on the DHS. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, you know, make, uh, well, anyway. Um, so, we're going to make it electronic, and then one of the things that we can do is, and I don't think it's in this current version of the draft, but and we do this with other folks that we license is to ensure, and facilities, is to ensure that there are certain criteria that are met as a condition of renewal. In other words, if you've got the NARM certification, you're a licensed professional midwife, that's one component, but then on renewal, one of the criteria that we could include in the final version of the rules would have a standard that needs to be met in terms of data collection and data reporting that would need to be met in order to have a renewal. So that's one, I'm not saying that's what we're going to do, but that we do have mechanisms on renewing licenses where we can set some criteria around things like reporting. Well, we have that now. Sorry. We have that mechanism now in place. We are required to f complete a quarterly, you know, for every patient or every client. So we, we do our quarterlies and submit them. And, you know, the quarterly has been in place for, I, that I know of, at least 20 years, that same document. So we do have that mechanism in place. I just think we need a better uh, mechanism for the collection versus the quarterly. You know, electronically and maybe the the um, information that's collected, and, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to get to is having clear fields, yeah. so it's user yeah. friendly as well as yeah. accurate as far as for the data. Mm -hmm. That that's the the department's intentions. 
And at, as we have electronic data collection, it's going to be a lot easier for our program managers to identify who's not reporting. But when you've got sheets of paper and busy people that are licensing all kinds of different facilities, it makes it almost impossible to carve out. Well, it's not impossible. Everything we do is a pro we have to prioritize our time. And um, when it's that inconvenient to determine compliance, it's just one of the things that slips by the wayside. Again, it's all created. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Manistats has created it. <laughs> Any other comments on the informed consent piece? Yeah, I'd have to agree with Dr. Manriquez. Um, everywhere in society, we go to the best source of information. And, you know, this is a life and death decision. Babies die every day. They die at home, they die in hospitals. Uh, the people that deal with that and have the most expertise are the people that can best explain those risks to, to parents. Um, you know, if I was accused of murder tomorrow morning, the legal system in Arizona is not going to let me defend myself, nor are they going to let me have a paralegal defend myself. You know, I'm going to have to have an attorney. Whether I listen to him or not doesn't make any difference. Is that true? not true? No, Oh, I could defend myself? Yeah. Okay, well, I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. Regardless. You just... Huh? The point is you wouldn't. The point is I wouldn't. The point is that most educated people want the best information possible, and the best information comes from people that are dealing with us on a daily basis. Um, as an attorney, I have to inform you of a constitutional right to be pro se in, in the case of your choice. And I guess my, my objection is the same as it was last meeting, that this becomes a non-consensual situation for the patient. They don't necessarily want to be seen by a physician or talk to a physician, um, but they're put in a position where they're going to have to get this permission slip signed if they want the birth that they want. So I, in some respects, I think that that is um, in, insulting and, and counterproductive. And to move backwards, um, we're uh, handing out a draft of the reporting form. Um, it's still getting worked on. Yes. That's kind of the idea the department has, is the information that we're requesting on that form. So you can look it over and if you have too. comments later on on it, you can bring them up as well. Any other comments on the informed consent piece? No? Okay. Any, um, I just want to touch on something that is new from this version and the previous iteration of the rules had just the informed consent for VBACs breach and multiples. This has an informed consent sheet for each one, for each delivery, for each one that, you know, for each attended birth. And going to, I, forgot, I forgot exactly who brought it, the question up about why um, we need the sheet of paper. And this is a sheet of paper rather than electronic, by the way. Um, and uh, one of the things that we need to do in order to effectively regulate any license, any of our licensed professions or even our facilities is we've got to have a documented trail to ensure that we've got attestations in place that that conversation happened. And if we don't have um, a document, then it becomes word of mouth and it becomes almost impossible to really regulate. And so while the vast majority of midwives are probably doing things appropriately and according to our regulations, our job is to find those that might not be doing that. And in order for us to do that, we need to identify those that may be making false attestations because they've got a sheet in the file when that conversation didn't actually happen. And so and that's one of our interests in making sure that we've got that documentation in place. But I wanted to just get that perspective from the committee because this is a new requirement um, on the informed consent side, not just for the VBACs, but for all of them. But there's two, the, the, what's intended here is to have two different informed consents depending on the, the risk. So the informed consent stays with the midwife in the chart or is submitted to the department? It'll stay in the, the patient's record. Okay. Yeah, it won't be submitted to us. Right. Unless we request it as part of an investigation or something. Right. So it'd be part of the you know, just one of the things for 
you know, if we did the feedback breach in multiples, if part of the concern is maybe that some midwives wouldn't present full information like the nitty gritty, is what you guys have drafted is, is pretty basic. There's not a ton of the nitty gritty stuff. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong that if we want to make it even more specific to make sure that each consumer is, you know, it's documented that they are getting tons of information. So just a thought. Thank you. Okay, the, the draft emergency action plan, um, need, one needs to be completed and kept on file for every patient, um, just like the informed consent piece. The midwife must attest that hospital delivery of the infant by an obstetrician could occur within 30 minutes if an emergency delivery is necessary. Must call charge nurse at hospital identified in emergency action plan for all patients when the patient goes into labor and when the patient delivers or requires transport. Um, some of those changes came from the previous meeting that we had. Um, I think last time it said call the hospital. We specified the charge nurse um, in this current version. Now, is this for all deliveries or just the higher risk deliveries, the expanded expansion? Well, we're going to have an emergency action plan for all deliveries. Um, the that thirty minutes. The thirty minutes is for all in this current version. And that would I. I have to just say, speak on behalf of the rural midwives. I mean, for me in Phoenix, it's pretty easy to be 30 minutes from a facility, but in Prescott, Cottonwood, on the reservation, southern Arizona, that may not be something available. Um, when, does, when does the 30 minute clock start running? Does it start running when you determine there's an emergency or when the EMT show up or when does that 30 minutes start? I think once an emergency, emergency is identified. Okay, just from flat out experience, I don't care whether you're in Phoenix or in Sholo, you, you identify an emergency in a house and you're not going to have that kid delivered in a hospital 30 minutes if the hospital's right next door. We have a hard enough time in a hospital doing a C-section in 30 minutes. So. So I, I don't think it's. I don't think any midwife could could do that. Um, I'm not sure where the 30 minutes came from, but it's virtually impossible. Uh, if, you know, you you identify a, an emergency, you've got to pick up the phone, call. They have to come, they have to load, and they have to go. And that right, that process right there is going to take more than 30 minutes. I have a comment on that. I don't see any. When a patient goes into labor, how do you know we're going to have emergency that far in advance? And as being the charge nurse in labor and delivery in the years past, I there's nothing I can do. I'm going to say congratulations. Best of luck to you. <laughs> Carry on and call us if you need us. I, I can. And give me your ETA when that shows up. I can address that for you um, from the other side of the fence in the rural area. We have limited resources, and we need to know how many people are in labor that we're responsible for. And if they happen to be at home, that's okay, but that helps us. That's going to, that, we only have two ORs, okay? We, we, we're going to keep one open. Um, so I, I wouldn't get rid of that. Um, I think it's very helpful. And, and really, it's people talking to people. There's nothing wrong with people talking to people. So I can take responsibility for this one being in the draft rules. And I had two... I had two goals that I wanted to accomplish by putting this in here. Number one is what you just described, so that in some cases it may end up being a nuisance call to the charge nurse, but in other circumstances, like in Sholo or something, it may be something where the charge nurse is like, okay, I'm not sure what resources I can get in here right now. I don't have anybody else in here delivering, so I may need to think about who's on call and those kinds of resources. That so one was the ability for facilities that have limited resources to be able to staff up or at least have the charge nurse put that in the back of her mind. But the other intent was to really drive that collaboration. And I think one of the problems that we have at, in this system here, regardless of the scope of practice, is that... Uh, there, I think, is an impression at some of the facility folks at the hospital that 
all we ever see are the bad outcomes. And so this starts to reinforce a way of thinking that the home births have bad outcomes because all I ever see are the bad outcomes that come by ambulance or on the rig and, or in person. And this way, I was trying to build that relationship so that the charge nurse would hear those calls. And in some cases, they may be valuable, but they might be nuisance calls in other cases. But when labor ends, and that's also in the this regulation too, is that they would call the charge nurse and say, everything's okay, we have a, a baby who's doing fine. So it would reinforce from the facility perspective that successful home births happen, and it would be, and there would be more than just, uh, so anyway, it was two things. It was about the preparation that might be needed, but also a way to try to put a catalyst on some of that communication. Here's the suggestion. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I just wanted to commend you, because that's the point. We're trying to change culture here. And and you do make a valid point. And yeah, it might be a hassle to pick up a phone here and there. But you, we are trying to change culture. And, and we, at the table, those of you in the audience, those young training physicians, it, there's more than all of us here that plays into this. There's There's governing bodies, there's lawyers, there's lawsuits, there's a lot to change this culture. So I, I agree with you. I, I think you should be commended on the idea. If somebody has a better idea, throw it out there. Here's a suggestion. Do what we're doing over at Mercy Gilbert Hospital. Every three months, we get together the licensed midwives in the community, all the doulas in the community, all the certified nurse midwives in the hospital. Uh, we haven't had any physicians there yet, but that's okay. Uh, we have the nursing a administrators, and isn't that working well? Yes. We, yeah, yeah, there we go. So there's a suggestion. Instead of calling the charge nurse, except for in a rural area, which I can definitely understand, that you would want a heads up of who's at home trying to do a home birth. I, would, I, I can understand that. But at big inner city hospitals or the hospitals that we have here in our area, I think it would be a good idea to get together, hospitals if you're listening, uh, to put together through the nursing department, uh, we call it midwife's tea. We meet every three months. Uh, we have some snacks there, and we talk about the issues. What are the issues? How did how did your transport turn out this what, this time? What can we do to make your transport e easier for you? And what I'd love to add to what we do in our tea is, hey y'all, how are your numbers? How many home births did you do this month? How many had to transport? How did everybody turn out? Uh, how you know? Uh, so th maybe that kind of a dialogue might be good, without involving a very busy labor and delivery department, at least in the city hospitals in in Phoenix and the surrounding areas. I think that when we look at this, the emergency action plan, that in the in the chart, the midwives should have a plan for every client, and they would note where the closest facility is, have the number in the chart, and if there is an emergency, then I would call the charge nurse and let them know what's going on and that we're coming in. Mm -hmm. I kind of just want to paint a really quick picture. So in a normal busy practice, six to eight deliveries a month. So twice a week I would be calling a hospital when somebody goes into labor and then when somebody births. So that's a lot of interaction with a hospital that 95% of the time I will never interact with. 5% of the time I do need them. So it, though it is building bridges and I'm, that's great, it's, it's a lot of phone calls for a lot of unnecessary um, reasons. Um, and then I think about the liability. So we're making a phone call to a person that now has some sort of liability. They at least have a heads up, correct? So they're taking on some sort of responsibility in some way. Otherwise, we wouldn't be making the phone call, correct? So I, I just think, where is that liability and what, what do you do with it? You know, I, I think, um, just to comment on that, it might be a waste of your time 95% of the time, but for right now, it builds bridges. It gets a dialogue going that's not there, and it's something that two, three, five years from now, maybe we could say, okay, we don't need to do this anymore. We do a lot of that. But right now, we're starting out at a deficit with a dialogue between medicine and midwifery, and nothing's going to get accomplished until we change the culture. Mm 
Yeah. Totally. I, I don't think it's a waste of our time. Um, you know, we go to deliveries and sit and knit for a little bit, but um, it, a busy hospital, I think, is where you're, you're trying to get a hold of that charged nurse. She's being tracked down. I mean, that's where I think, like, maybe we're taking away from time of a very busy hospital because we have the time to do it, but usually, sometimes not. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay. The draft scope of practice must be NARM certified to manage the higher risk pregnancies, will not be expanded to those who are not NARM certified. And this would go into effect July 1st of 2014 if it goes into effect as drafted currently. So any how many midwives that? would that currently affect would be my question because I don't, I don't know what the stats are of how many licensed midwives you have now who are not CPMs. And what that would do. Don or Pat, do you have the answer to that? How many of our licensees are currently NARM certified? Yes, at this point, they would say probably half to three quarters are, but that's rough at this point. Okay. It's an interesting requirement because a lot of the ones that aren't NARM and CPM certified um, are the ones that have been practicing for 25 or 30 years. So they have the years of experience, but maybe not the certification that you're requiring for the younger midwives. So it's an interesting juxtapose, I think. And the, one of the reasons I thought this would be a valuable piece to put in here is that the NARM curriculum includes the VBAC kinds of stuff. Whereas the current midwives that are practicing for 20 or 30 years, that hasn't been in their scope of practice. So then, you see what I'm saying? So I wanted, I, I thought if we're, if, if we're going to expand the scope on things like VBAC, you got to have some assurances that the training has been there, not just the experiential part of it, but that, because like I said, they were not supposed to be doing VBACs anyway. Sidebar, you know, we're going NARM, and that's going to go into effect. So all the future students, and that's something that I don't know has been brought up yet about the future for the students and the apprentices that are practicing now. I don't want to go off, you know, the agenda, but I just think that there are students that are in active apprenticeships right now, and is there anything in the draft stating that they're going to be grandfathered in or are they going to have to complete the NARM process for licensing? If they've been working currently on licensing, it was ADHS licensing, there's two different dynamics there in training. And I think that for the future students, it should be uh, addressed. Well, th this is, so the, the, our, the current draft talks about um, grandfathering in our licensed midwives now. But if we expand scope to include, include these other elements, only the NARM certified midwives that we license. So a subset of all of our licensees would be authorized for that additional scope, not the grandfathered. But, but the students right now that are doing the licensing element for licensure is different than the NARM process. You have the PEP process and then you have Arizona licensing and they're two different things. So I think that you have to, we have to address the students that are like in a, one or two years of apprenticeship and clarify that they need NARM documentation or they need state documentation and when does that, the state documentation end? Yes. Because you have like the NARM coming up now in end of November, right? the NARM examination, and are, are those students going to be then doing the state practical or the NARM practical, and um, how, what does that look like? And I just wanted to bring that up. I don't want to go off topic, but I know it's an issue for students. No, and that, that's a good point. That's something um, we have not specifically addressed in the rules. Um, as of right now, the, the draft um, stands is that as of July 1st, those 25 um, pieces of paper at the submit for every birth delivery, all that um, would not be submitted to us. Um, mm -hmm. That's the deadline is July 1st. So that's your state line versus the, the NARM documentation line. We can you know discuss that, address that later on. Yeah, but I mean, I think the point you're making is, and it's a good one, that we need to have a real clear demarcation yes. because we've got yeah. our current licensees 
the folks that are in transition, and we just need to make sure that we're capturing, that we're thinking, th that we're thinking through those folks that are in transition, kind of like we did with the medics when we redid the rules. And I think the for difference the for most is 25 versus 30, correct? No, no. no. It, there's a lot of differences, and I'll give you an example. I have somebody who's very skilled. She was apprentice midwife. But if you go NARM, she can't use the preceptor that she has now. She would have to find a different preceptor because her preceptor, in order in NARM category, she has to be a CPM for three years or have attended so many deliveries. And that's not how it is in the state. So it does make a big difference in whether or not she'll get licensed in a year or three years. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments on the slide? Is there something that could happen for the midwives who are already licensed and not CPMs, some sort of additional training or some, you know, maybe, a, yeah, I don't know if you guys want to do another test or I just heard somebody say testing, so that they don't have to go and get their CPM, these, some of these midwives who've been practicing forever, but then they'd still be able to, you know, manage those pregnancies. I don't, I don't know how to write that into the rules, but if there was something we can do there. You guys had continuing education type activities as it was. I mean, is that not true? And maybe something that, for example, our whole maintenance of certification as physicians, obstetrician gynecologists have recently taken a new track and what we have to do. And so it wasn't like that historically, but it recently started that we had to do a lot of articles, retest. We're not at the point where we have to do a practicum and a demonstration, but it's been had to be restructured. And since you're already getting these continuing education type things, isn't something that could be built into for those individuals that they don't have to go exactly to this, but they can be that same product could be built into. I mean, I'm not. I, I realize I'm, I'm walking on slippery stuff here trying to tell you but it's just an example of what we've had to do and and it's effective and it's it's met the needs of, of demonstrating lifelong learning and competency and just as the Arizona State Board of Nursing there was a time when all advanced practice nurses all of a sudden now have to have master's degrees and in the future very near future do we have a date of what for advanced practice nurses have to have doctorate degrees in the state of Arizona it's coming up um, so, it, as for the Arizona State Board of Nursing, a date is set. All new students coming in who want to be certified nurse midwives or advanced practice nurses have to have a master's degree or coming soon will be a doctorate's degree to practice. Then all of us old people who have master's degrees were grandfathered in. But the new ones coming are going to have to be doctorates. You don't know when that, you don't know when that starts? I don't know when that starts. Lynn, do you know when that starts? I don't think we've said it. But we have been, we have We're been, us older, older nurse midwives and nurse practitioners have been around long enough to when we remember when it went to be an advanced practice nurse, we used to have bachelor's degrees and all of a sudden the Arizona State Board said as of this particular date in two years time, all advanced practice nurses must have a master's degree in either nursing or a related field. Any other comments? Okay. This draft contains the advisory committee um, established through the rules um, versus the, the session law that we're working with right now. The committee is established to review data from the reports, examine evidence-based research, and recommend to the director changes in the regulatory rules. The draft committee consists of two licensed midwives, two public members, two physicians with experience in obstetrics, one physician with experience in family medicine, and one nurse midwife. Um, this would also go into effect July 1st, 2013. I believe that um, committee is very similar, if not identical, to the committee that's at the table right here as far as the makeup. Any comments on that? It must be licensed midwife dominated. We're, we're reviewing our own stuff. There's no one that knows it better than us. It has to be licensed midwife dominated. 
I'm not opposed to having doctors. Yeah. I'm not opposed to having nurse midwives, but we must have majority licensed midwife. Must. What other um, entity that serves women have, like, OBs? There's no midwives on there. There are no licensed. I'm not on any committee, you know. So I think that when you go back to what we reported, Initially, in the report we gave you in the advisory committee makeup, it's majority of midwives. Any other comments? And we see that evidence in every state that has a board. Every state, period. Majority is licensed midwives. I wouldn't disagree with, with that concept, but I would encourage to maintain physician members, if, if nothing else, for the establishment of collaboration and, and culture change. Then another comment would be, where do you have the regulation? Um, I see that the establishment of this committee is to review the data from the midwife report, examine the evidence-based research, I love it, recommend director, director changes, but where do you have the regulation of, what if there's a midwife out there who is not functioning and, not, and going outside of scope or whatever? That's the complaint process. So is it in the advisory committee to no, do that? That's there's a written complaint yeah. process. It, it's yeah. not in this draft. Yeah, my intent with this was um, for the committee to be more strategic rather than tactical. In other words, to help us look at the big picture, look at outcomes, look at best practices, identify trainings that the department should put on for our licensees. Um, work with the Child Fatality Review Board as that annual process goes through. So it would be a, that larger sort of strategic thing, but not tactical around, you know, uh, like the medical board does, where they have disciplinary kind of stuff. Okay. Now, that would strictly be the administrative process if someone wasn't reporting or you know, there was consistent bad outcomes or someone consistently going outside their scope of practice or those kinds of things, that would be handled the way it is now. Difference being, we'd have much better data right. with which to provide our regulatory oversight because we're going to have um, electronic reporting and we'll be able to much easier, it'll be much easier time for us to uh, execute what we're already responsible for. Uh, well, I understand that the committee, as you've put it up here, is not sort of law, the law keepers. They're not the people that go out and make sure that the rules are being followed. But where does peer review fall? Does peer review fall in this committee? When, when this committee looks at trends and we say, we see this trend, how, do we look at it, or we, the committee look at it, or who's, who's going to do that? Well, uh, to me it was, uh, we also regulate uh, the pre-hospital world, the EMS um, world paramedics and EMTs and so forth. And I've got a committee that's very valuable to me called, um, we've got Medical Direction Committee and the EMS Council. And those committees, while they don't have any operational control over what we do, they provide, when I go to those meetings, very valuable insights so that I can see in a real practical way what's happening in the field which helps our, not just me, but my whole EMS Bureau to make sure that we're making good decisions in terms of systems change. So what I was looking for is something similar to that that we could use for the midwives to look at best practices, look at the education, what does the latest literature show, um, uh, you know, look at you know, the trends and outcomes because we're going to have better data they're going to be able to look inside that data and give suggestions to the department about either A, what interventions we could do through the perinatal trust or through our licensing. Of, you know, we license hospitals as well. So, you know, I wanted to get some perspective from the system about, you know, advising me and future directors about ways that we could improve quality and make sure that we're doing our job. And to, so that's... So we started as a, just the starting point was, I said, I remember I told you, I said, just put what, put the committee content that was in the statute, just to make it easy. So that's what you're looking at right here. We can make modifications. But I would like to keep it, you know, uh, diverse enough so that we've got a perspective from various disciplines and it doesn't become monochromatic 
because that's you you lose you you're un, you lose the ability to look at systems issues if you just have a monochromatic type of committee. Agree with you completely, but I do still believe the majority should be licensed midwives because nobody knows our job better than we do. And absolutely, physicians, nurse midwives, but majority must be licensed midwives. Um, if I can speak really quick to the peer review, NARM actually has a process in place um, for peer review. So going to a NARM state, we can adopt similar practices, um, but that's already, it's very formalized. Um, in the report that the midwives submitted at the very beginning, it's outlined in there what we think peer, sh peer review should look like. Okay, so to make sure I'm clear, this committee then would be charged with looking at trends and looking for best practices and quality. Okay. Right. But, but I don't envision them getting into the detail about, you know, this person should right. go to hearing or this kind of stuff. And that's it for the uh, discussion of the rules. Um, so, so that's where we are. There's a lot of detail in the rules that you can, you know, uh, study up on. Um, as soon as the U of A's report comes out, we'll get it to the full committee. And I can't stress enough how important that's going to be for me to really look at the literature and the strength of the studies to help figure out where we can strike a reasonable balance with the, the scope and uh, at the same time staying true to our mission in regulating and ensuring um, that, well, so, she, so Janice asked me when that would be done. Uh, we, we asked them for early March, so um, this is mid-February, so probably th three weeks. It may or may not be ready for the next committee meeting. Um, so. With that, let's go ahead, and I know we wanted to use, spend a lot of time on call of the public, so we have till 8 o'clock to do that. So who has been running logistics? Oh, we have a whole sheet. Okay, take it away, Tom. We have a lot of people uh, wanting to voice their comments today, and we're going to have to limit to about a minute, so please, 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 please keep it to a minute. And uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I butcher anyone's name. I can't read my own handwriting, so... First person, I'm just going in order off the stack here. If anyone else wants to comment, please give me those sheets uh, as soon as possible. First person, Jamil. Jamil? Jamil. All I'm right. giving my time to her, though. Who's her? Um, Brady and Rogers. If my uh, fellow doulas would like to stand up here. We all actually signed up for time, but we just have one statement that we're going to say, OK? Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Breland Rogers. I have two children, both born in a hospital, a degree in healthcare administration, and I am a birth doula. I am standing here today to speak on behalf of Arizona doulas. The doulas with me here today and those listening from afar have had the privilege of attending hundreds of births in hospital, home, and birth center settings. We are here because we support women's right to choose where she births her baby and with whom. This is about trusting the midwives that Arizona has licensed to evaluate each woman individually to determine what option is best for her and her baby. It is about giving women access to the care that they desire. It's about reducing the risk of women choosing to birth unassisted because they don't have another option. Unassisted birth does happen. We can assure you of this because sometimes as doulas we are asked to help. A woman birthing at home is being closely watched um, from the moment labor is established and her midwife and birth team arrives. A midwife attending a woman at home only has one woman to look after and because midwives know healthy and normal and are very familiar with it, they have the ability to spot what is not healthy and normal and act accordingly. This is much safer situation than a woman laboring with only her partner. The women who are asking for a VBAC are carrying twins or have a breech presentation baby who are asking for the option to birth at home are the same women who, if forced to birth in, birth in the hospital, will stay home as long as possible, unmonitored, in hopes of arriving at 8 to 10 centimeters. They will also be the ones who are refusing monitoring, IVs, and a whole array of things that are standard procedure in a hospital. As home birth advocates, doulas, and women, we support a woman's autonomy. We support and respect the intelligence of mothers. Please do not pretend that anyone cares more about a baby's safety than the mother. Thank you. Caitlin Laney. My name is Caitlin Laney. I hold a bachelor's of science degree and I'm a public school educator. I'm also a two-time home birth consumer. 
I'd like to thank the state for opening up this rules revision, and I'd like to thank each of the committee members for your efforts and contributions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing your part to ensure that women like me have safe alternative options when it comes to pregnancy, birth, and postpartum care. I urge the committee and state to look forward to this opportunity to directly impact the health and well-being of Arizona families. My hope is that you can continue to work successfully together to ensure that as the midwife scope of practice is expanded, it meets the NARMS CPM credentials. You're not alone in these changes. Please look for guidance in the other states around the nation who are already successfully implementing the CPM scope of practice at the licensing level. Please do not make your recommendations from a misguided or fear-based philosophy. Birth is a normal physiological process, and as long as I'm in charge of my body, my baby, and my birth, I will continue to choose competent and compassionate licensed midwives. Thank you. I noticed the last two speakers had, had uh, scripts reading from. If you want to hand those in, you don't have to. We can scan them and post them on our website as well as public comments. Jennifer Bass. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Bass. I am a mother of four children who are all born at home. I hold a master's degree in public health. I'm also a licensed and certified professional midwife here in Arizona. I want to first of all say thank you to all of the committee members and all of the consumers and other midwives who are here um, supporting the choices that we are trying to, as we try to fix the rules and regulations. Um, the one thing I want to address on, for the advisory committee is that we are switching to a CPM state. So we need to be following the recommendations of NARM regarding regulations of CPMs, which states that legislators, and this is a quote from NARM, need to provide oversight of CPMs through a board of midwifery or advisory council comprised mostly of licensed midwives and having the authority to set guidelines for CPM practice. As the current draft stands, as we've discussed a few times this evening, there are two midwives, four physicians, and two consumers on the committee. I ask that the committee make sure that the that gets switched so that we have the majority of licensed midwives with some physician and consumer input as well, um, just as Norm recommends and as many other states are doing. I also believe that midwives and consumers, mothers and families will continue to choose home birth. We must ensure that they have access to trained midwives who can monitor moms and babies during labor and birth. We all know how ACOG feels, but not every parent agrees with the physician's trade organization's opinion about her body. I would like to see that we move forward to better serve families in Arizona who will stay home. Thank you. Ayanna Walker. Ms. Walker. Thank you. Um, my name is Ayanna Walker and I'm a student midwife. Um, I just wanted to share a brief um, story about myself. Um, I knew since I was 12 or 13 years old that I was going to deliver babies. Point blank, player, just knew it. I fell in love with infants. Um, I had a grandmother that was a charge nurse in an OB unit, so I just followed her as a little candy striper, just engrossed in it. Um, it wasn't until I actually got pregnant with my own child during the course of exploring that medical career and I experienced care from an OB that I felt like I don't belong here. I did not feel like um, I was heard. I did not feel like I was cared for. And immediately, like, uh, probably went to two visits, and I was just like, I'm done. What's out? What else is out there? Um, and I discovered midwifery and doulas and the, this wonderful world of caring and trust and empowerment that I did not have before. Um, so I just want to urge that um, the committee and everybody here to continue that, like, let that passion thrive, let it explore and expand to other communities, to other types of people, to, to other demographics, to other women who think that their options are limited because we all, as humans, need more human interaction, more love, more caring, more kindness. And I don't think that that's happening in our current environment. I think women are being forced and, and being thought of as, as uneducated or, or not researching or not and just, just being ignorant. And that's really not the case. As somebody who chose not to take that medical degree and is still pursuing this level of education and by learning and doing, I feel like this is the most important thing that we can do in Arizona is just continue that and to open it up to more people. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Henderson. Mary Henderson. Oh. 
NARM is a rigorous process for training and certification. The Certified Professional Midwife CPM credential issued by NARM is accredited by the National Commission for Certifying Ag Agencies, NCCA. The NCCA accredits many healthcare credentials, including the Certified Nurse Midwife, Two pathways to CPM certification, formal education through a MEEK school, the Midwifery Education Accreditation Council, or the portfolio evaluation process. Meet the requirements for NCCA accreditation. Recommend that the Department of Health and the Advisory Committee utilize the documents available from NARM to have a full understanding of the various requirements, including skills verification, which includes VBAC, requirements for updated evidence-based practice guidelines, informed consent documents, and emergency care plan. It is the only midwifery credential that requires out-of-a-hospital experience. Thank you. <laughs> Christina Bowman. Excuse me. Do the scrolling. Miss it. Sorry. <laughs> so my name is Christina Roman. I am a mother of four, and I also want to thank Will Humble and the committee for the amazing, transparent proceedings. I am so proud to claim Arizona as my home. And as a side note, I wish DC would take notes from you. <laughs> Why are we choosing midwives? We want, as a consumers, the midwifery model of care. We want to be treated as individuals. We like the time we get to know our midwife and the time they take to know us. We like the approach that birth is sacred and it deserves the kind of time and care we get from our midwives. I want to repeat these points from Janice's uh, presentation. Midwives acknowledge the power and strength of women. They acknowledge the importance of self-determination the active participation in the care of themselves, their babies, and their families. We get compassionate care. They honor normalcy. They believe in watchful waiting and believe the birth experience has a profound effect on mother and the humanity. I want us to remember who is driving this movement. Consumers want choice. Consumers started this movement with no money in the bank and a lot of heart behind their belief that all mothers should have access to qualified, supportive, compassionate care in the home setting where they are low risk or if they are higher risk and want to find knowledgeable care at home. What are the key points I would like the advisory board to hear? Consumers want choice. Licensed midwives have a choice and both have the right to choose. Consumers want access to compassionate care at home that honors their ability to give birth. Along those points, Midwives want the best outcome for the mothers and babies they serve. They know the extent of their training and normalcy. Midwives don't want to transfer. They want safe, non-emergent outcomes for mothers and babies that they serve. If they are going to say yes to any of the options being considered by the Arizona Department of Health Services, they will not do so if their training is just adequate. Knowing how much they care about the population they serve, my guess is that ones who are going to say yes to those mothers are not just adequate, they are abundantly knowledgeable will take the steps to be so when they care for a VBAC, breach, and or twin mothers when agreeing to the care contract. If a midwife knows that her client's needs do not match her skill set, then she can decline care to the mother. She will decline care to the mother because above all, midwives care deeply about the mothers and the babies. They want a healthy mom, healthy baby outcome, not just sometimes, Christina, every can you wrap time. It up, please? Yes, I will. Every time, even when it is a decision to recommend something that no client wants to hear before the baby's birthday, the better choice for you is to baby and your baby is to transfer care. So to, to wrap it up, for them as care providers. Thank you. Rochelle Price. Oh. <laughs> I think we have about 30, 35 more comments in here, so please uh, don't be here all night. I'm grateful to live in a country where the rights not specifically given to the government are reserved to the people. I'm also grateful that in Arizona we have codified that to include my right to birth wherever I want. I'm somewhat concerned about the attempt for those who are not midwife educators to limit what of experiencing shoulder dystocia both in a hospital setting and in a home setting. Thankfully both times the carefully selected caregivers were able to use their training and experience to provide a successful outcome. 
तो मैं बोल of protecting my body from the cutting, tearing and bruising that I experienced in the hospital. Turn to my normal activities, a welcome change from the long convalescence following the birth of my eight and a half pound hospital baby. I would have felt even better if my midwife had been legally allowed to offer me an IV during labor when it was needed. I'm here today to ask as a consumer that decisions about what a midwife can handle be left to those who train the midwives and the decisions about where I will birth and who will attend me will be left to me. Thank you. James Hoodenpile? I butchered that one. My name is James, uh, educated and informed father of eight, six home births. Um, sorry, there's not more husbands attending to support their wives. Um, that's right. <laughs> and that's okay, too. Um, um, a couple of quick facts and then a bit of an extreme example, but uh, it makes a point that needs to be taken into account. Um, undue burden on the midwives and on parents, um, infringement of rights of choice and privacy will drive midwives um, and parents underground. There will be more unattended um, births, there will be more unlicensed midwives practicing. Um, the undue burden of medical intervention, the undue burden of increased uh, record keeping and advance permissions to act will cause prices to increase that will reduce the availability to midwives to parents. Um, the example being, sorry, the example being um, Though an extreme example and from ancient history, um, in Egypt, around 1000 BC, we have a pharaoh who demanded midwives to kill the male children of all slaves. Midwives chose to lie to the state, and wives chose to hide their children. That is what the state, that's what can become when undue burden is put upon the state. We know it's already happening. You know that there's midwives practicing. You know that there's mo mothers already having unattended births. Um, the question becomes how far do you want to push the midwife and how many rights do you want to remove from the parents that will cause this to increase. Thank you. We have a nice little timer up here now so you guys can see how long a, a minute is. Uh, Robert Hasso. All right, this is actually pretty quick. Um, I was actually looking at House Bill 2247 this afternoon, trying to just get a better handle on how this whole committee works. Um, well, according to Section A, the whole purpose of it was to reduce regulatory burden on midwives and streamline the regulation process. Um, the way this all starts, from what I understand, is that in Section B, um, a report is uh, delivered to the state uh, to the consumers. At that point, you have to convene, you know, as we are here, and then discuss, you know, expanding scope of practice as defined in those happening. But I'm also seeing a lot of things going outside that scope. So, question to the lawyers and people like that: um, How far are we going here? Because it looks to me like we're kind of wandering out of it a little bit. So, um, and I've got a little, you know a few issues with that. Uh, some of the issues like the 25 mile requirements, things like that, were actually increasing regulatory burden that wasn't actually here before. So I guess my question is how far are we going with that? And I'll submit that to the state as an actual comment on the website. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie Okafor. I'm going to speak as fast as I can here. I'm a concerned consumer. I believe in a woman's right to give birth where and with whom she chooses. I am a home birth mother of two. My first was born in 2009 and my second 16 months ago in 2011. They had absolutely beautiful births into this world. Let me begin my thoughts by sharing some statistics from a study published in the Journal of American Medical Association which revealed the extremely poor, poor, poor performance of the U.S. healthcare system when compared to other industrialized countries. I oppose the, I'm sorry, this is an Arizona statistics, but they weren't available to me. Um, Keep in mind, these are hospital statistics. Thirteenth, last for low birth weight percentage. Last for neonatal mortality and infant mortality overall. Eleventh for post-neonatal mortality. 
and adverse effects from medical treatment is the third lead leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. Some other studies have that as fifth, but I think we can all agree that's too high no matter what. Um, I do not condemn the physicians themselves for these numbers. I believe most of them are doing their very best and have a genuine concern for their patients' welfare. But let me remind you of the cardinal rule of Western medicine. First, do no harm. By revoking a healthy woman of her, in my opinion, God-given right to choose her place of birth and with whom, you have already broken the cardinal rule in two ways. First, for the reasons I previously mentioned, and second, by the nocebo effect, which means that the mind is engaged in negative suggestions that can damage <coughs> excuse me, the health or have negative effects. This is a fact that you and your doctor should both be aware of when you step into the doctor's office. By words or demeanor, physicians or nurses can convey hope deflating messages to their patients. Messages that are sometimes unwarranted. Birthing women are even more susceptible to these messages as, the, as they are at their most vulnerable. Can you finish it up, please? Yes, due to their body's acute awareness of any potential threat. I believe many women are robbed of healthy, normal birth hospital, in the hospital setting because of this type of situation. For example, I'll be quick. I know that we all are aware of somebody that has had to get a C-section in the hospital due to shortly after they arrived there, their labor failed to progress. Um, I believe a lot of these cases are due to one of these hope-defeating messages or our body's primal perception of danger. It can be as simple as somebody saying the baby is really big, you might need a C-section, you might have trouble getting them out. That's, that's bad. Okay. Moving on. Sorry, I'm going to skip a lot of this We're stuff, to which go to the next person. I feel is really important. But the bottom line is, I'm an educated woman that was made with hours of research about my health and the well-being of my baby. Statistics are on the midwife side. Thank you for your time, and thank you for listening. Yeah. I'm Natalie. I'm a little bit different than some of the people in the room because I have had a C-section with my first baby. Um, I was actually lied to by my care provider at the hospital. Um, I had slightly elevated blood pressure. They told me I did in fact have preeclampsia and my lab work was positive. And then when I switched to a new care provider for my second baby, the doctor said my lab work was clear. I was bullied into making choices and I wasn't. I had the fortunate experience of having a natural VBAC at a hospital. to have a home birth um, with a naturopath for my third. I was told by a physician, you will never have a birth vaginally. You just were not built for that. I was cut from hip to hip. It hurt when I urinated for a year. So to hear doctors compare risks, like we know the risk. For women like me, there's risk to everything. There's a risk if I go to a hospital to have a C-section. There's a risk if I go to a home birth. There's a risk if I have a birth in a hospital. It's not free of risk, but it should be up to me and my husband and my family to choose what risk is acceptable to me. And I just ask that the state follow suit, like they have in so many other areas with vaccines. And you know, unfortunately, even though I don't agree with it with abortion, and give women the right to choose what's best for our bodies based on evidence that is there, like you guys have been doing. So thank you for your time, and I really do appreciate it. Bonnie Swanson. My name is Bonnie Swanson. I have degrees in... I'm the mother of three children, all of which were uh, midwife attendant. The first was in a hospital, uh, which was a wonderful birthing experience, and it was the post-birth hospital experience that drove me to have my second and third uh, at home. Uh, I don't really know what the hospital policies were, but all it appeared to me was... Uh, and, that's, and that's my experience. Uh, what I see up at the table here and what I see out in the audience is a number of different perspectives. I, I hear testimonies of physicians sitting at that table who see heartbreak every day with things that can go terribly wrong with, with pregnancies and, and birth experiences can, that can attest to the two births, all three of my births 
I, I'm one of those women who make birth look ridiculously easy, apparently. You know, one of the, fav the, the midwife favorites, right? Yeah. Baby comes out, sew it up, you're home in six hours. Uh, what, what concerns me, and I'll speak as an, as, as an engineer now, the concerning lack of, of data available both to do research and then even acknowledged here that how many of the, how many of the, uh, the births aren't data-based, how many, how many experiences aren't there to even look at. And as an engineer, I, I say, how, how can we really make any informed decisions about, about anything here or, or anywhere when there's that much lack of data? I would, I would consider that one of the foremost priorities. Second thing that really concerned me, the whole discussion about whether to make a phone call or not a phone call, or if you're in an urban setting or in a rural setting. But what came up is that this phone call may change the structure of viability. If communication becomes a punishment, and that somehow there's, there's, there's a change in liability because a phone call is made, and we're talking about that this is a problem. I'm all about communication, and if there's, if there's punishment perceived in making communications and making phone calls, Other than that, everything that I have heard from some of the, from the women and men speaking out here, I'm behind 100%. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Hi, my name is Sarah Swanson. I'm a two-time home birth mother uh, here in Arizona. And um, what, what I hear and see at the table is everyone stating their desire for collaboration between the traditional medical field and the midwifery model. And again, this is speaking from my experience of, of two, is the midwifery model, it, it takes you know, the evidence that, that is available, limited though it might be. I appreciated that my, my two midwives, they spent the 45 minutes of the hour with me and they got to know me and they told me all the risks and all that stuff and then they addressed me. I wasn't a number in a report or a, you know, X percentage here or this percentage there. It was me and my body. And they just, they got to know me and what was right for me. And when you're trying to create a model of care, you have to realize that it's every individual woman's body and her choice. And that just, that really needs to be respected. Um, so I, I appreciate what the committee is doing, and I think they're they're on the right track. Um, but it just it really needs to come to the individual woman's ability to educate herself, you know, with the help of practitioners. So it's her body, her choice, uh, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sabrina Pell, and I have five kids, four of which, believe it or not, with my home birth shirt, four of them were born in a hospital. And doesn't matter why, it was my choice. And I got to use my educated choice to have a home birth when I wanted or a hospital birth when I wanted. Um, sorry, I'm ADD. I have to have notes, otherwise I'll tell you about my daughter's trip. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm very passionate about home birth, and I think everybody should have that right. And it was suggested mother, that mothers who want to have a home birth have to sit down with an OB first and have a consult. And I want to talk about why that's a bad idea. Okay, first of all, I want to talk to you about a story that happened to me. I was sitting in my OB's office when outside the door, the OB had a conversation about another client on the phone. And it went something like this. I have a client, so-and-so. She wants to have a VBAC, and I'm going to send her to you for a second opinion. Please get her into a C-section. Okay, these things happen every day. And that is why it's a bad idea. Now, the idea that midwives are unable to or unwilling to give true informed consent is insulting. And midwives are very educated and very capable. Um, that's wrong. And also, I'm sad to hear major abdominal surgery being compared to a cut on the finger. That's absurd. Um, having to fight for where we're going to give birth to our babies when other women have the right to end their pregnancies. We should have the right to choose to bring life in a positive way. So, sorry to bring up another big topic. Um, 
basically, I just want to urge you guys to realize that we deserve the right to choose. It's our body, our baby, and our birth, and we need to do, make the choice that's best for us. And we are capable of making educated choices. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> oh, come on. You don't want to take a stab at it? <laughs> okay, I have two points to make. First, as an apprentice midwife, I feel it's unrealistic to have an OB agree to assume care. That requirement would virtually render it impossible for me to get my license. Um, as a consumer and mother of four, my first three births were cesareans. My last birth was a home birth. It was a natural VBAC. I'm going to speak to the exclusion of a VBAC mom with the diagnosis of CPD or failure to progress. I was previously diagnosed with CPD for my first birth. I went on to have two subsequent elective repeat cesareans because I believed that. My fourth baby was a home birth VBAC to a nine pound, 13 ounce baby girl who was one and a half pounds bigger than my biggest baby to date. The first thing my husband said was she could have done it all those years ago. She could have done it. I underwent three cesareans that were not necessary. And trust me, they were more than a minor cut on my finger. Thank you. Tanisha Batiste. Hi, my name is Tanisha Batiste Roloffs, and I believe in a woman's right to choose. As I'm not here to bash hospitals as I do believe that they serve a purpose when they are needed. Instead, I'm here to stand up for women and what should be their right to choose, not only where they birth, but also who attends that birth. Licensed midwives provide consumers such as myself not only the ability, but the safety of their training and knowledge to allow women to have the birth experience of their choosing. We've done our research. We've decided what risks we are willing to take. You're essentially trying to take away our freedom to choose. Some of these rules and regulation changes you are trying to implement would take away a midwife's ability to provide the service that so many of us women desire. You can't tell a midwife she needs a doctor to sign up to provide pack up care if necessary without making the doctors provide that signature. Also, if a woman wants to have a VBAC, birth multiples, or a breech baby in the comfort of her own home with the care and security that a midwife provides, that is our right to. Don't take away our freedom over our bodies or our births. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie Petrucci. Melanie? I'm a mother of two and I'm currently 20 weeks pregnant. First of all, I'd like to say I love seeing the changes to the scope, including VBACs, multiples, and breech births. I like the idea of setting some parameters for VBAC home births, but I strongly disagree with the parameter of failure to progress. I labored with my first child without medication for 30 hours in the hospital. I stalled at 7 centimeters for 12 hours. I know that the medical staff was in fact in the corner whispering about the threat of a C-section. I was tremendously lucky to have two doulas and an OB who to get things going, and that did the trick. Unfortunately, my body still wasn't ready, because once I got to 10 centimeters, I pushed for four and a half hours, with ever, without ever feeling the urge to push. I, I know of friends who have had C-section after six hours of stalled labor. I realized how different each pregnancy and labor can be. With my second child, my entire labor was three and a half hours from my first contraction to her birth. I labored at home, in the water, without distraction or interruption, with my skilled and licensed midwife and dual by my side. I had the urge to push early on and was excited because I never felt that with my son, even after four and a half hours. I definitely did not stall at any point during that labor. And I wonder what would have happened if my first had ended in a C-section. I understand there are times when C-sections are medically necessary, but I also know that hospitals have policies and timelines. Some labors take longer than others, and some hospitals don't allow those mothers to labor as long as their bodies or babies need. And I think that that results in more C-sections due to failure to progress. We as women aren't broken. Sometimes we just need more time. Perhaps a woman was induced and her body wasn't ready yet. 
Perhaps a woman was uncomfortable with one of her nurses and was feeling stressed. Perhaps she was tired from being up with a sick toddler days before her labor. Just because she was failure to progress with one labor doesn't mean she will fail at all her labors. The woman's body is designed to give birth, especially when left alone to do its own thing. Many women feel that they can have a smoother labor at home without unnecessary interventions, perhaps with their older child by their side, in a birth pool, with candlelight listening to their favorite music, without the unfamiliar people, noises, and smells around. It should be a woman's choice to decide if she wants to see that her body isn't broken, especially if she wasn't given the opportunity in the first place that resulted in a C-section. Can you the wrap truth, it up, please? The truth is you cannot compare laboring at home and labor in the hospital. Thank you. <laughs> Laura Mercer. I'll be brief. My name is Laura Mercer. I am a OBGYN, a chief resident at Banner Good Samaritan Medical Center. Um, and I'm here not as an adversary to the entire room of people looking at me, but as someone to say that we are all here on the same page. I've said this at meetings be before, um, but I really encourage us all to focus on some of the really good things that have come from this meeting in terms of looking at smooth transitions and how we can all work together, learn from each other, and ensure safe outcomes. That being said, as we look at the increased scope of practice that we've looked at and heard a lot about today, it terrifies me to think about breach deliveries at home, um, some of the TOLAX or, or VBACs that we talk about coming at home, and that comes from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deliveries that I've attended, both in the United States, in a hospital, and also in rural parts of underdeveloped countries in Central America. And I think that those risks, though they're small, are very significant, and we can't forget about how catastrophic those outcomes can be. Thank you. Sarah Arrington. Nope. Sarah, skipping over you. What's the last thing? She's upset. Sarah Arrington. Hi, I'm, a, I'm Sarah, I'm a mother of five, and I had something a lot longer that's not going to fit into a minute, so I'm just going to be really quick. I came here because I care about our rights as women to give birth where and um, with whom we choose, and for it not to be restricted to licensed midwives, um, I should have the ability to for a friend without fear of them being um, getting in trouble. I've had two unassisted births with my last. I just I would like things changed. I would like there to be a provision for mothers like myself to have people at our birth that may not be midwives, um, but to afford them. Thank you. So I just want to give you kind of everybody a status update for where we are. Um, we've got 15 more speaker slips from this room and 15 more from the other 1740 building where we have other people watching. You know, all I'm saying is if you have something um, that's distinct or, or uh, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> we have if everyone sticks to one more minute to a minute, then we'll be here for half an hour. But just take into consideration, um, you know, where we are with the agenda. Connie Canada. I'll be brief. I'm Connie Canada, licensed midwife and certified professional midwife. Um, I basically wanted to talk about the, um, sorry, about the um, physician and hospital requirement. Uh, I licensed in the state of Arizona and I am under the impression that the department gets to choose whether I have a license or not by following the rules, taking my test. Putting the ability into a physician's hand to say whether I can practice or not is against that license. 
It is the department's responsibility to say whether I can license. Also, the, um, the fact that you would require of ultimately my choice or a hospital of my choice when that physician may not be under their insurance responsibility onto them and again that's just limiting choices this is with whom she wants and we should not be limiting that thank you Jennifer Hoprich and also, guys, you can submit your comments online, too, if you want to provide your stories there, or because I didn't hand those in as well. We'll scan them and put them online. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Hope Rich, and I'm a home birth midwife. It's a county access plan. And reminding us all that it is birthing women who are the impetus behind these discussions we're having today regarding the expansion of practice for midwives. And they are asking for what, in my opinion, should be a basic human right. The right to choose a safe place to birth and a safe care provider as they define them. Subsequent to review and understanding of the risks and benefits of all options, I believe women are capable of choosing what is best for their families. For the loudest in our ears as we leave this evening. Along that vein, I encourage all birthing women to share their stories and their voice here. This is a quote from Ursula K. Le Guin, an American author. We are volcanoes. When we women offer our experience as our truth, all the maps change. There are new mountains. That's what I want to hear, to hear you erupting. You mount If we don't tell our truth, who will? <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Humble Committee. Uh, my name is Chapman Kosky, born and reared here in Arizona, uh, and I hold three college degrees, whatever. Um, I'm sharing here today, well, in honor of my mom, my precious wife, uh, mother of three, but um, though considered low risk when our first child, my wife, uh, was, in, was informed that she was scheduled for induction prior to the due date, wondering and concerned over why the rush, I made inquiry only to eventually learn that the doctor was going to be informed and educated by the healthcare professional himself in matters such as the epidural, we were either left uninformed, quote, no one gets points in heaven for feeling pain, or misinformed, an epidural cannot affect your baby. The calls persisted playing into my wife's normal concerns and fears of the unknown, resulting in an attempted induction via cervidil, to which my wife had a near fatal reaction for her. Just following standard hospital protocol and interventions for low risk births and a signature episiotomy my wife gave birth to our first child. The seen and unseen scars of this experience helped escort us into the wonderful world now guarded primarily by midwives. In this newly found sphere of love, understanding, care, compassion, and respect, we've enjoyed and been empowered by two safe and interesting Mary Langley, so also Mary Henderson. Being low risk and informed and afforded the opportunity to experience the interventionless home birth under the respectful professional care of our midwife, we are forever grateful for our right to birth at home. There will always be a need for professionals in the healthcare industry who are trained to care for high-risk mothers and or handle the unforeseen complications birth present. But may it decreasingly become the reality that said professionals overstep their necessary and proper place in the sphere of birth or even undermine the equally necessary role of midwives. Likewise, may more and more families present and future actualize their right to be embraced by the beautifully empowered empowering and possibly pinnacle of this human experience, best realized without unnecessary interventions, as we have found, now facilitated primarily by midwives. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Diane Bayes. Diane. I'm a CNM that does home births, and I work at a birth center. And uh, I just want to say I truly believe in home birth and that women have the right to choose 
where they give birth and with whom. I have uh, been apprenticeship trained. I started in 1971, so I've been around for a while. Worked in hospitals, know how they work, um, and I truly stand firm. I believe in home birth. Oh, I've worked in a lot of other countries, too. Thank you. Pamela Qualls? Hi. Licensed has been by for 14 years, and I'm going to make this really, really quick. Please, could the state look at the draft that the midwives put forth? When you're looking at all the rules revisions, the midwives did not, as the consumer said, we did not ask for this scope increase for VBACs, twins, and breaches. What we are looking for is to please fix our rules. <laughs> We submitted a very lengthy report, it's awesome done, and a lot of this stuff could totally be taken care of and not even an issue if that was looked at. Um, it doesn't look like it's been looked at, looking at the draft rules. My next request is that for the rest of the board and anybody else to please look at the NARM, uh, the CPM uh, licensure, the status and what that looks like. Because a lot of this stuff, you know, peer review, we already have peer review in place, but a lot of the concerns here will be answered if you would just go ahead and go and, and look and see what's in there. It's all there. We want a lot of this stuff. We've already got a lot of this stuff in place. Every time we have an outcome that's not so wonderful, we've got peer review. So. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. Ann, Ann Palzer. Ann M. Palzer. My name is Anne-Marie Palzer. I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor practicing in Arizona. I've had three children. My first was born at home. My second was a C-section for transverse lie, and my third was a planned home VBAC that was successful. In choosing to be back at home, I assumed the risk for myself and my child. I was fully informed of the risk during my prenatal visits and from my own research from primary resources. I was an excellent candidate for VBAC because I met the following criteria. I had a low transverse incision with double layer of suturing. There was greater than 18 months in between my pregnancies, and I had an ultrasound at 20 weeks to rule out problems with placental placement. I was not willing to submit to non-evidence-based doctor and hospital standards of care, such as no eating during labor, routine epidural and IV fluids, routine vaginal exams, and continuous fetal monitoring that would limit my access to different coping methods. I was also not willing to be pr pressured or submit to procedures that would increase my risk for rupture, such as any form of induction or augmentation, both of which are routinely done under an OB's care. I fully support expanding the licensed midwife scope of practice to include VBAC. Thank you. Andrea Engelman. Thank you. My name is Andrea Engelman, and I have made the informed decision to give birth to my children at home under the care of licensed midwives. When Governor Brewer signed HB 2247, the intent of this bill was to reduce the regulatory burden on licensed midwives and increase the scope of practice at the request of the consumers. Unfortunately, some of the proposed revisions seem to increase the regulatory burden, place restrictions on the scope of practice, and ultimately infringe upon Care. For example, requiring a midwife to identify a hospital and doctor in the licensing application is an increased regulatory burden. Additionally, it appears no doctor would be willing to enter into a, a written agreement, although perhaps Dr. Manriquez would be. As a consumer, the emergency care plan a midwife develops is patient specific. I live two miles from Scottsdale Shea, but unless an absolute emergency and I knew my only option is a C-section, I would choose to transfer to a hospital that has a better reputation for respecting natural birth choices. Additionally, requiring a phone call at the onset of labor increases regulatory burden and violates my privacy. I don't even call my own mother when I go into labor. I'm not going to call a random hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Silverblum, Silver did you want to talk? I have your notes here. And this is, I am actually not going to say what I was going to say. I am an LM, a CPM. I am also a mother of five, three of which were born VBAC. I do appreciate what you are doing and that you are open to listening to us. I do implore that we, we could sit here and debate all day long the safety of breaches, twins, VBACs, home births in general. 
But the thing is that every single parent in this room made a decision while they were pregnant what level of risk they were willing to assume. Whether it was the risk to have an epidural, a C-section, an induction, a home birth. We all made decisions with regards to our birth. And I see this more as a women's right issue. Women are not asking if they can have home birth breaches, VBACs. What they're asking is if the state will allow people like myself to use my education, my experience, to make that decision as safe as it can be because they are having these VBACs, they are having breaches, and if you remove the ability for me to get trained and then legally attend them, then we are saying that them choosing that level of risk, we are going to punish them by removing their care provider options. And I don't think that that is advancing women in, in, in this state, in a proud fifth generation Arizona. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Breland Rogers. Breland. Oh, I think that was me and I, I already. Okay. okay. I did. Right. Kevin Compass. Yeah, I'm real quick. <laughs> Bottom line is it's a woman's right to choose. To all the, not horror stories, but all the, <laughs> the risks that go along with, with VBACs, multiple births, breaches. I think that's something we need to talk about and, and everyone needs to be informed on. But the bottom line, is it, bottom line is it's a woman's right to choose whether she wants to have a home birth. It's her right to choose that and we need to respect that. There was a good... Um, quote up on the board in the beginning, it said, uh, um, the decisions that the, that the board makes affect the midwife's ability to, to uh, practice. Taking that step further, not only, not only does it, excuse me, I'm a little nervous, sorry. Not only does it uh, affect the decisions they make, it affects the decisions and the rights of a woman. So, be brief. Thank you. <laughs> Diana D. <laughs> My name's Diana and I'm a student midwife. In regards to postpartum hemorrhage and anti-hemorrhagic medications, I'd like to request that you consider expanding the current rules so that we may obtain and administer drugs in accordance with current standards. Pitocin is an excellent first line of defense, but in the event that it is not enough, we need a second and a third line of defense, not so that we can keep mothers at home as long as possible, but so that we can stabilize them while we await medical assistance. Thank you. Katie Miller. My name is Katie Miller, and I had a home birth on April 1st, 2012. I'm a biomedical engineer, and I work as a quality manager for a medical device company that manufactures devices that save people's lives. Through my work, I have seen firsthand the value of hospitals and the necessity of doctors and surgeons. And there is no debate that this is, there is a time and a place when they are needed. However, we need to remember that this is a women's rights issue and that in requiring me to ask from another health care provider, you're not letting me make my own informed choices. We all need to remember that Mothers want the best possible outcome for our children. From choosing to have an ultrasound or an amniocentesis to deciding to birth in the hospital or at home, please remember that women deserve the right to make their own decisions regarding their health care, and we should not be required to ask for permission for that right. Thank you. Amanda? Jay? Oh, I think that's yeah, that's too much repeating. All right. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. Jenny Larson. Hello. Um, as a student midwife, I am knee deep in education right now, and I just wanted to point to the, the idea that, um, that we would be allowed to do, if these changes, any changes go into place, that we'd be allowed to do them if we were NARM certified. 
um, but we need to take into account the midwives that have years of experience and give them access to, um, to training and the ability to do some, something in replacement of that NARM certification so that they aren't axed out of all of the um, any changes that would take place. Um, uh, as far as a, uh, from a mother's standpoint, um, it's my choice to take the calculated risk and I would like providers um, to give me um, adequate care that in my own home. Thank you. Thank you. And Jody Brock. Hi, my name is Jody Brock and I'm a consumer. I've had nine babies of my own in a variety of different settings. And some of the best births that I've had have taken place in my own home with midwives. I believe that women are smart enough to do the research to choose their own care providers. Women should have the right to choose where they birth their babies and who they want in attendance. We're perfectly capable of obtaining informed consent and understanding the risks and benefits of both home and hospital birth. And our midwives are perfectly capable of further explaining those risks to us and elaborating on anything that we may have questions about. Both the NARM and the Arizona State Licensure Tests establish if a midwife is trained enough to practice as a licensed midwife. That's what the licensure tests are meant to do. And in my opinion, there's no need to scrutinize this process that has been effective thus far. Home birth after a cesarean is not illegal. It's being done by CNMs and NPs. So all the statistics that are proving that home birth after cesarean is safe are really not the issue. The issue is whether licensed midwives will be able to do the same. I think it's ridiculous that in 2013, women are still having to fight for their God-given rights to birth how they choose. No one cares more about the safety of babies than the mothers giving birth to them. And we should be trusted to choose what we feel is best for our families. Birthing freedom is a human rights issue. I should not have to ask anyone for permission to birth in the environment that I feel the safest and most comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. And the next Thank you. Steve, we're ready for your first questions over at uh, 1740. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Hylia Medell. I am um, a consumer. I have birthed all three of my children at home. I am also um, 32 years ago. I was a home birth baby here in Arizona, along with my two younger sisters and most of my cousins, one of whom <laughs> was a VBAC breach um, about 26 years ago. The, the point to, to I think, this, this scope is for consumers to have the choice to birth where they choose and with whom they choose. By allowing the consumer to choose, knowing that they will take the opportunity to inform themselves and have their care provider provide their options, you give them the um, responsibility back to birth and allow that responsibility about labor and birth to be on them, giving them that right of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Caitlin Stout and I have my twins at home. I'm a consumer with no affiliation to the birthing community. I'm a married mother of three. I'm an engineer with an additional bachelor's of science degree in economics. I could afford the $250 insurance deductible it would have cost me to have my babies in the hospital. I did extensive research before making my decision to home birth. I had my first baby with a certified nurse midwife at a hospital. That birth was induced for post dates of 41 weeks. It was too early and it ended up in an unnecessary C-section. My wishes for a natural birth were not respected. My official diagnosis was failure to progress CPD. I believe that my best chance for avoiding another unnecessary C-section was to have my next birth at home. When I found out I was having twins, I did more research and then decided to see a perinatologist group for prenatal care, follow strict nutritional guidelines laid out in evidence-based research, and assuming I made it to full term, give birth with my husband's help at home. I had a safe, perfect birth. Unfortunately, after the birth, I had to transfer to the hospital for a retained placenta. I was treated like a criminal to be punished in the on-call doctors by the on-call doctors and not like a patient to be helped. I did not choose this for the experience. I did this because I wanted the best possible outcome for my babies. 
Both babies were born healthy and perfect. One was breached. They were both over eight pounds, and they were born at 40 weeks, three days. I believe I achieved that goal. Director Humble, please consider expanding the scope of midwife practice to include women like myself a safer way to home birth. We'll birth no matter what, but this will provide us with a better way to handle emergent situations. Women like myself will choose to birth unassisted regardless of risk, and we deserve a care provider if we want one. My name is Kelly Crawford. My first baby was an unattended hospital birth, and my second was a home birth attended by a midwife. I would just like to say that the majority of families choosing home birth do so for safety reasons, because the common interventions most low-risk women receive in the hospital that result in so many iatrogenic complications are risks no midwife would ever take at home. What needs to be made clear is that a low-risk home birth is not the same as a low-risk hospital birth. Births seen in the hospital are not anything like that which we would see in a home birth. We are not asking to have hospital births at home. In fact, quite the opposite. Even with the higher risk births proposed, there are risks being taken in the hospital that neither midwives nor consumers would ever dream of taking at home, like augmenting a trial of labor after cesarean, for example. In that light, I understand why an OB might be terrified of things like HVAC. If the hospital-based providers want to keep VBACs in the hospital, it is their own responsibility to decrease the risks and restrictions they impose on consumers. Aside from that, we are not discussing whether hospital or home birth is better or safer, but whether we are going to support the autonomy and safety of the families choosing to birth at home. Those who are choosing to birth at home with the midwife are the same who would be having an unassisted birth otherwise. So the goal here is not to debate which is best, argue or demean anybody. It is to make the families who are choosing home birth, regardless of anybody's opinion, as safe as possible, to give them the opportunity to have a medical provider there and a smooth transfer of care in the case of hospital transport. Because a transfer to the hospital is not a home birth failing. It is the midwife's model of care being practiced responsibly. These mothers should re remain autonomous in their health care choices and we need to ensure that the midwives are able to continue the high standard of care they currently provide Arizona families without restricting them through some of the proposed policies. Everybody has the right to personal autonomy, regardless of age, gender, or active labor. Rachel. Hello, my name is Rachel Davis. I have a master's degree. My first child was born in the hospital and we were told that we had failure to progress and we were encouraged to have a cesarean. But thankfully we had a doula with us who provided support and with our own um, ideas for ways to progress the labor, I went on to have a natural vaginal birth in spite of the hospital, not because of the hospital. I went on for my second child and we saw an OB at the beginning of the pregnancy, similar to the model that was recommended of seeing an OB when a mother is planning a home birth. The OB told us that the pregnancy was not viable and she pulled out her tools for, to perform a DNC. We denied the procedure, continued on with the licensed midwife, and my daughter is now 18 months old. We had a beautiful, successful home birth. Again, with the support of a, a midwife, she stayed with me for three hours after my daughter was born. Two midwives never let my, left my side. It was a night and day difference. I want to conclude by encouraging, again, the dialogue between the midwives and the OBs. Um, maybe the OB should consider having their client see a midwife and have a form signed before they continue on care with the midwife. I would also, unfortunately I'm not pregnant right now, but if I were, I'd love to invite an OB to attend my home birth so that you could see what it's like. Thank you. My name is Dr. Jenny Duvizar. My suggestion is if you want to change the current culture of the birth practices in the medical establishment, open up the current scope of practice. We cannot change the current perception of the safety of home birth with the current scope of practice. As we consumers have seen here so far, the medical establishment still does not recognize our licensed midwives as being educated, trained, or capable. If you're really looking for statistics on the safety of home birth for VBACs, I happily submit myself to the cause of research. Give me the opportunity to do so. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Mallory Smithwick, and I had a successful home birth 19 months ago with my son. Um, I just have a couple quotes to read. They're very quick. Um, this is from Heidi Reinhardt, MD. To put it bluntly, women with successful BVACs have the lowest morbidity. Scheduled repeat C-sections have the next lowest, while unsuccessful BVACs have the highest morbidity. In several large studies of VBACs, the following factors were seen more frequently with uterine rupture. Prostaglandin cervical ripening, cytotec, mesoprostal ripening, induction of labor, use of pitocin, failure to progress, forceps vacuum, and epidurals. While home VBAC does create time and distance barriers to responding to a crisis, home VBAC does not introduce iatrogenic risk. Thank you. Hi, um, I just wanted to make a really quick comment. I am a mother of three. I had my first baby in a hospital. Um, and I'm also currently an apprentice midwife. Um, and I would just ask the committee to look at the rules and make it possible for my midwife to carry the drugs that she needs to keep me safe and for me as a future midwife to be able to keep my clients safe. My name is Michael Richardson. I'm a U.S. Marine, retired medically. I've got a couple college degrees. My income is comfortable enough that I could do anything I wanted to do for my children's birth. Both were born at home after substantial research on the issue. I've only attended one hospital birth, and it sadly held up to uh, my expectations. That said, not only does the existence of any law dictating how a woman should birth represent a violation of her basic civil liberties, the double standards that I don't believe exist at any level anywhere else in this country, but any law requiring a woman to seek any medical assistance for birth, especially a non-holistic care, uh, such as that, which is standard from an OB, treats birth as a disease instead of a sign of health. Medicine exists to treat disease, and unless significant anomalies exist, birth should be seen as a sign of health, and women shouldn't be penalized for that sign. Nobody has the right to dictate the births of my children more than myself or my wife. My name is Jessica Richardson. My husband pretty well inter introduced us. Um, I just want to say a couple things regarding the geography of the state. Um, I've heard it many times that Arizona has unique geography and thus we cannot compare it to other states. However, uh, the state of Washington has an awesome transport system, and we can't deny that the Cascade Mountain Range runs right through it, and there's a lot of inland rural areas. There are mountain passes that are impassable in winter, and yet women birth there, and they have home births, and they have transfers, and they have VBACs, home births after cesarean. Um, the other thing I'd like to make a point to is uh, Dr. Manriquez, um, she was encouraging collaboration. And after the last meeting where she more or less said, I will never support home birth after cesarean, um, you have to forgive our skepticism. Okay. So I would request or ask the hospitals and OBs in our state to reach out to us. Let us know that you want to work with us. Give us an opportunity to prove that we do, in fact, want positive transports when necessary. We want smooth transitions when necessary. Give us the opportunity and show us you're going to do it without animosity. Dr. Aaron O'Sullivan. Okay, we're done. Sorry, three more here that were left hanging. Uh, Connie Garcia, she stick around. I have two more. Lindsay Schneider. She was. She went. She was on the in the other room. Oh, for two. Tamalyn. There you go. Hi, I'm a certified nurse midwife. Um, I had my first baby in a hospital, laboring in a jacuzzi with no IV, no pain meds no drugs of any kind and very little um, fetal monitoring. So I definitely empathize with the idea of having a low intervention birth. 
and I definitely agree that one intervention can lead to another in a domino effect. So um, as a midwife, though, I do only hospital births, and um, but I do my best to not do intervention unless necessary. Um, what's a little bit confusing to me is um, one of the things that are requested in the expanded scope of practice is the, to do the breach uh, deliveries. And um, that's something that even physicians don't do. I mean, uh, there was a, they used to um, in the hospital, but the randomized controlled large international study that was done showed that actually babies um, had worse outcomes with vaginal breach deliveries than actually having a C-section. So that's not even an option for physicians to do, so I'm surprised that people would want to have a midwife do that at home. Um, and we actually had someone come into the emergency room a few years ago where the head, I mean, the body had delivered at um, home, but this breech baby's head had gotten stuck, and um, you know a lot of time was lost in transport, and the cervix actually had to be cut in several places to deliver the entrapped head. So um, I understand you're saying you already know the risks or whatever, but um, so much time is lost in transport once there actually is an emergency, as as was said earlier, and so. Um, I totally get the low risk home birth, but I don't understand the high risk with the amount of time it would take to transport the baby. Um, you could lose mom and baby, which is, of course, not what any of us want. Okay, so um, thank you all for your comments, uh, both the folks at the other building and the, the folks here and those that have already gone home and those that have watched it on the live stream. Um, the last part of the agenda is uh, to s set up the logistics for the next meeting. Um, is there a general feeling? I mean, we've we've had we had two daytime meetings and and two of these evening meetings. What's the feeling from the committee about? We need a daytime meeting. Yeah. Many people from around the state, rural areas that have hard time getting here are wanting to come but just can't in the evening so because they have to travel three hours and to travel three hours at nine o'clock at night is harder for for like Tucson Flagstaff and right. beyond they would like to come but well, in the evening it's hard for them to okay. come okay uh, I get it but what I'm trying to get is for the committee now I, let's do the committee first for what logistically works for a quorum and so forth I don't think anybody comes any farther than I do and I, I'm okay with nights Whatever works. Okay. <laughs> this is the most consensus we've had in a long time. Um, so we're all flexible. Evenings may be better for some of us. Um, I'll have my team work on an email to set up, you know, to you know set up the times for when the next meeting might be good. Uh, days of the week. Um, is there an issue with days of the week with anybody? I know last time we had a Wednesdays were better, but I think Mondays are great for me. Okay, so we'll avoid Tuesdays and we'll look for some times that may work uh, with everybody's schedule. Um, with that, uh, thanks for your participation. Um, like I said at the beginning, we've got a long way to go, but I think we've come a long way so far, and uh, we'll have a next iteration of the draft after we get both the comments from the meeting today and uh, the, you know, the information that we get online. Um, so any other? Weeks weeks? I, I'm not sure when, I mean, I have, we'll have to do it by email. And by the way, you can reply to emails and stuff and not violate the open meeting law if you're just talking about meeting times and stuff, because that's not substantive. Um, you just do one of those, you know, at the beginning we did one of those surveys and everybody got to pick the dates. I think that was the most helpful and then you can choose whichever one we all said we can go to. Yeah, okay. So that's what we'll work on. Um, thanks everybody for your time. Thank you. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.